organizations and to partner its projects that tackle the major themes of today, to further the Foundation's networks of beneficiaries and connections, and to extend the Foundation's activities beyond its headquarters. On the other hand, culture has always played a major role in the Foundation's activity since its creation in 1956. And in our view, it is essential for an enlightened and complete citizenship. Therefore, abiding by these guidelines, we embrace this project with enthusiasm as we believe it fits perfectly in our mission. As a house of culture where the audiences play a major role, it is therefore with great pleasure that the Foundation embraces a Veste Plus project and it hosts its first summer school and international conference dedicated to audience development and organizational change in a fruitful partnership with MAPA das Ideias, who I'd like to um, salute this afternoon. Audiences are indeed at the core of any cultural and arts institution and play a major role in the way organizations define their identities, their aims and goals, and ultimately their relational values and principles. Thinking about audiences is thinking about a dynamic and ever-changing relationship, about participation and empowerment, and consequently thinking about organizational vision, mission, and practice, a debate worth full engaging in. During this summer school, on the next five days, cultural professionals, organizations, and policymakers will be gathering and working together on audience development, acquiring knowledge and information, exchanging expertise, and getting inspiration in a nurturing and professional environment. We're grateful to the team of people involved in the making of this program, and especially to Mapa das Ideias, our knowledge partner, but also to, another, to all the other members of the Adesti Plus, whom you will have the opportunity to meet during this week. The Gulbenkian Foundation has long contributing, long contributing to the debate and shaping of cultural knowledge and its response to societal challenges. As cultural professionals, we acknowledge the importance of designing opportunities for discussion, for deeper understanding, for imagination and cooperation, for learning and transformation, and we hope that this summer school may become this nurturing place for change. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, good afternoon. Uh, Madam Board Member, Teresa Patricia Gouveia, dear colleagues. We are delighted to have all with us for a week full of interesting conversations. And first of all, I would like to thank, in the name of the 15 partners from seven countries from the ADES Plus project, the, well, 14, because we're thanking them, the Gulbenkian Foundation for all the effort and the heart that they put in the organization of this first summer school. It was a wonderful process for MAPA des Ideas because we had a chance to make all the conversations and discuss all the details without the logistical burden. So for us, it's a dream come true. true. So that's one of the things is, it has been a delightful experience and it's been a real privilege to work with the Gulbingen Foundation in this specific summer school. And I know that all the partners of the project are very happy. I would just want to point out some highlights from the, this summer school and what we are thinking about we are going to do in the next days. The idea of the summer school is to build upon the events uh, across this week. And the idea of building is really in the core of the summer school because we had the same kind of effort and care choosing the participants as we had when we were building the program of speakers because we're really interested in joining these wonderful people together to work in uh, this um, idea of a school. And in the spirit of a school, we really want you to leave 
Friday with more hope. That's an important part, more knowledge. And like in any school, new friends. That's an important part also of our experience. Another point about the summer school was that we were very worried about the options that you could take during the week. As you saw, we organized a very wide array of options because we were very interested that each of us could choose their own personal journey. We know that each of us will have their own personal journey, not only because of the options, but because each of us brings the burden of each own past and professional framework. And that's interesting because it's a little bit like when we're doing audience development at our own places, right? Because we're talking the same with everybody, but each of us brings their specific context. And that's a very interesting thing. So that was one of the other points that we wanted. We built the options. And in some cases, you're going to find that the options is slightly different from what you chose. But that's because we're trying to pop, and that's one of the Adesh's goals, is trying to pop the bubbles. So we don't want museum people just talking to museum people. We want everybody talking about everything, all about these common audiences that we share. So that's an important thing. Finally, I want to discuss uh, the tasks. Each day you will have a new task. It's a very personal task. You can do it, you cannot do it. So it's not like school in that uh, point. But the idea is to help us rethink and think and reimagine and imagine all over again the way we work and the way we think about things. So the tasks are little pointers that we bring so you can just maybe play a little bit with the concepts that we're talking about, maybe incorporate some of the, the concepts. And finally, this project is not only about arts, it's about knowledge, and it's not only about arts and knowledge, it's also political. And this is one of the things that we really believe. And since we have to work hard sometimes to defend our principles, we decided that to organize a summer school with more or less 90 participants during a five-day cycle wouldn't be enough. We decided that uh, Wednesday and Thursday, we will receive 120 plus for an European conference. And if this wasn't enough, uh, Thursday and Friday, we will have a policy forum that will also be undertaken with like 20 people. So it's going to be a very full week. We hope you will have a wonderful time. And this is all about this idea of sharing and being together. Thank you very much. Hi, welcome again. I'm quite happy to have you here and to be part of this. It's not usual that I read what I'm going to say, but I don't want to repeat myself or say uh, things that have been said, so I'm going to read. When we accepted the challenge of being part of the Adeste Plus, we had no idea that what this task would mean. Because it's not only having three things, three different things in a week, a summer school, a, an international conference, and a policy forum, but it's being part of a never going and long lasting debate on culture that we all should make part. I do what I do and I work for Gubenkian because I truly believe in change and accountability. And it is also at the heart of the Adeste Plus project. Arts and culture can foster change and discussion like no other sector. And when we started to imagine this first summer school, we are concerned about being, doing things not only good, but right. Some of the changes sometimes are in the details and everything should be taken in the same, in, with the same importance. We wanted the Adeste Summer School to have certain things that could count also as a principle of action and a value. So for instance, we wanted to be a green event. 
with a minimum waste and a minimum uh, environmental print. So, as you can see, the only thing we gave you was this, where we condensed all the information, uh, a map, uh, a QR code that directs you to the places where you can find the rest of the information, just trying to make our print less than it is now, because it's a major concern for all of us. All the coffee breaks are thought also to have a minimum uh, print, and all the flights were bought with a, a program of carbon-free, a program, and all the details were thought as to be part of a value that when we talk about audience development, sometimes we don't think of. Audience development is not only about people there, the people who address. It's about us. It's about there and here. So having a, a wonderful team working on these was also something that we cared of. And I must thank all the people that have been working hard with me for the last weeks to make this become true, and all the partners that are inside this room, and they will show up later on. Just to give you an idea of the dimension of this partnership, I would like to ask all the Adesi Plus partners to stand up for a while. We hope that in the end of the week, we don't distinguish anymore the partners from the participants, and that we are all a big team that debates and discusses the future of culture and audience development. So thank you again for being here. Thank you for being part of this movement. And let the works begin. I don't know, we don't need presentation. Hi, I'm Rosa. Hi, I'm Okay, so that's our presentation. <laughs> so, uh, just welcome everybody. Also, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just to uh, uh, welcome you as the project leader of your Desta Plus project. Uh, I've been so lucky, so I have to say, in finding these partners, amazing partners, and especially the Portuguese partners, because without them, anything, anything would have been possible. So really, I want to thank them, and you will, you will hear a lot of thanking this week, so we will be thanking all the time, because we are really thankful, actually. Uh, so we just uh, imagine, could you please put the presentation on? Just to give you, yeah, thank you. So we will just introduce, just to tell you how it's going to work this afternoon. Uh, we are going to have, does it work? Maybe not, maybe yes. Anyway, I know the plan in my memory, so I can tell you. So we will have um, now a few ideas we will present to you because we thought, together with Anne, we thought that actually uh, it was really needed to have, to give you the frame, not of the Adeste Plus project itself, but of what does it mean audience development for us. And this because, of course, we know this is not, this is a tag that has been used a lot. And luckily, it appeared on the European agenda because it wasn't actually uh, a topic discussed, usually discussed in cultural organizations before. So since 2014, actually, it appeared, and you know, in the, in the first place, there was the word. So when you name something, something suddenly becomes true. And this is what happened. So we know that we have, there are a few ideas around the way we are working on audience development that it's really worth sharing with you because this is like setting the stage for us. And um, so we will have then a uh, uh, few ideas about what do we mean by this project and this summer school. 
and uh, what is specific of the Adeste Plus way of tackling the audience development challenge in terms of activities and so on. Uh, so we will be introducing the audience uh, thinking, let's say, the design thinking approach that we are trying to bring into the audience discourse in cultural organizations. And then we will have, let's say, a break that is supposed to be in 45 minutes, something like that. Uh, then we will have the chance to listen for the case studies, so representative of the case studies that you maybe visited this morning and maybe not, because we will have the three guests. And this is quite important for us because it's also the opportunity to listen. Uh, if you were probably concerned what I'm going to choose as a session, this is the opportunity you will have to meet the others. Uh, and uh, then uh, we will discuss with them something around what they did, trying to look into those case studies through the lenses of what really matters for us. So this is what is going to happen. Everything is going to be ended by six, something like that, or 5.50, or 5.30, something like that. So we will try to be on time. So uh, first of all, introductions, I would say. Yeah. So, so is this mic working? No. no. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, so, introductions. Uh, you know who Alessandra is, and you know that I'm Anne. Um, I'm also Chief Executive of the Audience Agency, off this week, running away from my colleagues. Uh, but we'd like to do that now. There's going to be lots of introductions, and but by way of demonstrating our commitment to many sources of different feedback, evidence, and data, we're now going to have a go at uh, practicing what we preach, modelling the being in touch with your audiences and being in a constant feedback loop. So what I'd like you to do is to get a device. Do you all have a phone with you? Does anybody not have a phone or laptop with them? Do you all know how to get online here at the Gulbenkian? It's not difficult, lovely free Wi-Fi. Get, get, get online if you wouldn't mind. And when, once you've got online, what I'd like you to do is to go to the website www.menti.com. We have time. Are you there? Yeah, everybody? Nearly? Okay. So once you're at menti.com, in this box, you need to put in this number, 998273. And is Tiago up there? Tiago, could you switch to Menti for me now? Here it comes. Can you see that? Can you? Oh. Ah, la la, there it is. Um, can you see that? Everybody see that now? Can anyone not see that screen? Please go back one. Uh, okay, so the number is. Oh, we've lost the number on the top. Yes, 998273. Thank you. Thank you, Tiago. It's supposed to come up on the top of the screen. I've done that wrong. Uh, great. Just proving you should never, ever consult with people. It's always a disaster. Um, so could you just go, go back to, the, to Menti for us again? Thank you. Okay. Are you ready? You got it. Can you now see that screen? Okay. You got it now? Okay, let's just try um How's it got that now? It's loading. Maybe there are lots of people all connecting in the same places. Well, we may have been let down by the technology guys. <laughs> That's kind of the. Uh... 
No, you can't. It doesn't work like that. Sorry. Uh, no, is it, is, it, is it coming up at all? No, I think it's a Wi. I think it's a Wi-Fi problem. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Right. Well, the point really is that you don't really have to reveal yourself if you don't mind participating not anonymously about this. So, if the, those of you who've been wor working in the sector for under five years, would you like to stand up? Stand up. We're going to make this very physical now. Okay, okay, interesting, interesting. That's nice to know. It's all the fresh-faced looking folks. Right, uh, what about six to ten years? Okay, okay. When are you standing up, Alessandra? Okay, T 11 to 20 years. Oh, God, and... and Yeah, thank goodness for that. And has anybody doing, been doing it for over 20 years? Thank God for that. Whew. Okay. <laughs> Actually, maybe that's nicer. Um, Indeed, right. Well, it's about, well, well, that was interesting because actually we're a very, really broad mix. So I think that's quite healthy. For the kind of conversations we want to have, that's great. We're, we're, quite, we're quite mixed. So those of you who've been under five years, we want your enthusiasm, your optimism, your fresh ideas and thinking. You have heard it here. Don't disappoint. Right. So um, I don't know whether, if it's not loading, don't worry. Oh, no, it doesn't like that at all. Um, so... Any, have we got it at all? Anybody see that question? Have we got it at all? Right, okay, let's go for it then. So in that case, um, those of you who would consider yourself an advisor, would you like to stand up? An advisor. So if you're a consultant or perhaps, a, perhaps an academic who's working closely with the sector, advisors, interesting. Interesting. You might be more than one thing, so you're allowed to stand standing up if this reports. Are you also, or an artist? Artists in the room? Consider yourself to be artists. Marvellous. So I like to see. Um, educa educationalists? Oh, lots of educationalists. That's good, because we want to have a nice learning environment. Fantastic. Uh, gen general manager? Stuck with doing all the general stuff, I think I'm probably these days. That's it, brilliant. Oh, lots of this, great, good. Marketer? I think I'm one of those two. Uh, br brilliant. Programmer or curator? I see the programmers and curators don't want to stand up. That's okay, you don't have to. I like it, yeah, great. Quite a few of us with more than one hat. We'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, other? Not to describe, ah, okay, others, what do you, okay, others, what do you do? Shout me out, what do you do, others? A distributor. Touring, lovely. Any others down there? What, what were you? You were other? A public servant. Brilliant, yes, thank you. So, yes, no, not, not, a, not an advisor, a public servant. Uh, any, anybody else? Any, any others would like to declare themselves? Uh, okay, yes, as a different school from, from marketing, yes, I like it. Any other, are there any PRs here? No, what are you? Fundraiser. Excellent. So we're a very broad church. Stand up if you stood up more than once. Do you have more than one hat? And you? Okay, so we are, we are amazing, multifunctional, we're, we're good at everything, right? The, the, other, the other category that we might have put on there was mediator, because we discovered in this field of audience development that this notion of a mediator was very important. Do any of you consider yourselves as mediators? Yeah, and we're mediators, right? So we are really, really good at talking to people in different languages, translating different ideas. So we should be having a really good time here at this summer school, right? So, uh, right, finally, we're getting there. I, it actually works just as well standing up, doesn't it? I just think it's a sort of thing, okay. Even better, it's healthier, it's good for your digestion. So what kind of organization do you come from at the moment? 
Okay, so who, those of you who work for a museum. Okay, good sprinkling of museums. Performing arts. Excellent. Uh, visual arts. Uh, support agency or funder or public servant. So I just took it, you nearly sat down there. That's good. Yes, excellent. Uh, freelancer or consultancy? Other. What are you? What are you, madam? Sorry. This. From an association, yeah. A non governmental association. Social economy, nice, interesting. Anyone else who's an interesting outlier for? I have, I, it's, it's a little bit about what we all describe ourselves as. Creative arm, yes, brilliant. Uh, any, anybody else? Yes. Nonprofit media, brilliant. Uh, and and some, Luis, some 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 universities <laughs> out there as well. Yes, there's some there are some more of you as well. I've forgotten about that uh, category. Indeed. Um, okay. Interesting. So again, really, really good mix. You'd have thought we planned it. Anyway, um, <laughs> uh, so and here's an interesting one. I, I'm not sure how we're going to do this. How can we do? What country are we from? Okay. If you are from, uh, do you know? Do you know? Uh, if you are from the EU definition of Northern Europe, would you like to stand up? No, you're not. Sit down. Sit down. Um, if you <laughs> Uh, great. If you are from the EU definition of Western Europe, that's us. Stand up. UK folk, that's us. We don't know that we are, of course, because we don't we sort of pretend it doesn't exist, as you know. Um, uh, if you are from the EU definition of Eastern Europe, would you like to stand up? Eastern? We know there are more. Eh? We know there may be more. They're not, they're not confessing to it. And, maybe, and Southern Europe? The Southern Europeans? Oh, shed loads of you. Woo! <laughs> and some of us have mixed hats on that front as well, right? So, you know, okay. That's because Portuguese says they are Mediterranean, Southern, and not Western. But yeah. they are the way, more Are they more officially the Western? Yeah, indeed. Well, it's very delightful to be here hosted uh, with you Southern Europeans. It'll do us all some good, I reckon. So, great. Thank you. Um, you'll get more chance to tell people where you come from, what you do. Is anyone not, not from Europe? Ah, excellent. Where are you from, our lovely guest? Israel. From Israel. Shalom. <laughs> Anybody else? Ah, where are you? Tunisia. Tunisia. And welcome. Welcome particularly to our guests from outside Europe. Very nice to see you. Thank you. Right. Okay. Uh, now, this one, I'm not sure. Is it, it's still not coming up, I take it. Now, okay, what I want you to do is, are you sitting next to somebody you know? Of course you are. Now, what I want you to do is, I, is, to, is to reach over to the nearest person that you don't work directly with. And I want, them to, I want you to spend two minutes just sharing with each other what you think your, your greatest professional challenge right now is. Okay? And... I, this is your personal professional challenge, not your organisation. This is something that feels like a personal professional challenge. And if you can't think of one, just make it up, okay? <laughs> so, very quickly, if you would just like to fi find someone you don't know, you can move if you want to, if it's easier. <laughs> fuck, fuck, Mentimeter. <laughs> Switch over, swap with the other person, if you haven't already done that. And, and stop. Okay. 
Um, this is the beginning of a conversation. We will be returning to this. Any, anybody would like to share? Any, did any two people have the same thing? Did anybody share the same challenge? You've not stopped yet. Did you have the same challenge? No. You can work together. Yes, exactly. Okay. Stop. Stop. It's chaos. I knew we were surplus to requirements. Okay, guys, just we're going to come. We have got some more sharing of professional problems soon. Sit down. Shut up. That's gonna, in the nicest possible way. Anton, get get sitting down now, please. <laughs> That's gonna, right. So, did anybody find that they had the same challenge in common? You three did. What was it? To create, to make museums more democratic spaces. Hooray, we love that one. Anybody else? Similar challenge? What was yours? The same. Oh, there's a big group of you. Right, okay. Remember what these people look like. There's a conversation that needs to happen. Uh, anybody, anyone surprised by the reaction of their colleague? Anybody, any interesting surprises? Okay. Did anybody have uh, exhaustion <laughs> as their problem? No one was listening to me. I might have had that. Yes, definitely. <laughs> uh, and what about not earning enough money? <laughs> um, the public don't understand us. Great. Well, as I say, we're in an opportunity to share some more of those challenges, both formally and informally, as we go through the rest of the day. Now, finally, this is going to be fun. Let's see if we can do this in a, physically, uh, a physical sense. Oh, no. Wait a minute. I've lost one. No, I've lost my... Okay. Where's my other question gone? I've lost a question. Oh. It seems to have gone. Okay. Well, don't worry about that. The question was going to be... Now that um, I'm just wondering if I could actually do it while while we're here, so that we can we can see. The question is going to be: Is there was? No, I think I, I think it's gone. Mm, yes, we won't do that now. Okay, I think we're going to say thank you all very much indeed for proving that. We forget the technology, who needs it, when you've got people in the room. So brilliant. Thank you all very much for playing with us. Excellent. Uh, Tiago, could we return to the presentation? So you get to relax a little bit now after all that jumping around. And uh, we'll, we'll share some thoughts with you, hopefully by way of a, a kind of a, an interesting conversation. I think we need to get back. How do I do that here? Can I get back on this screen? Hmm. We can't see it on our screens here, but... Oh, we can see it on our screen. No, I think I've just done the wrong thing there. <laughs> and, and technology, that's the title. Yeah, never never let me yeah. anywhere near it. <laughs> okay. So... Actually, what was pretty funny is that when we realised that we had this auditorium for the first session and we said, oh, no, really, it's the first time they met. So they will meet and they will have to actually be in together. We have to set up kind of, you know, feeling. And we can't do that with that setting with all that chairs and so on. So we said, how can we make it more funny in a way and just make it comfortable? Oh, well, let's use Mentimeter. It works wonderfully usually. <laughs> but now, so it ended up in a gym, but why not? So could you please put the, uh, the presentation so that we have... Okay, so this is just the moment where you don't have fun, and, but I do, because I like so much what I'm talking about, what I'm going to talking about. So, um, introducing you at Asta Plus, you should all have been participating in uh, web webinars, so, I mean, what Asta Plus is about, how does it work, more or less, and if you want to know more, you can get check it on, on the website. What we would like to stress now is much more what uh, does it mean for us, 
Mm. What's behind that idea? What's behind that label, that tagline, or whatever? Actually, what is happening here is the result of six years working uh, together uh, with some of the partners here and others uh, along the way uh, with whom actually we were, um, let's say, questioning ourselves about cultural participation and thinking about how could this be uh, achieved somehow. Our perspective were quite different, but actually what happened is that our first Adesti project really went beyond our intentions because we were just you know, working actually on training. And what happened is that we opened up a Pandora's base. So we really realized that this was an issue for so many of us across Europe, across the sectors, and across professions. So what happened actually is that each time we met, we just met other people, and each time we talked to other people, they were bringing in their interest into the conversation and their enthusiasm and also challenging us. So what we realized that this was something more than a cooperation project focused on training and just tackling one of the many ways of tackling the issue. So we just realized this was bigger than expected. Um, so I will just... Uh, uh, show you this, uh, I don't know if in the webinars all of you had the chance to see it, but this will help us just letting you know uh, what did we learn over time and what happened actually. So the very first idea was of training audience developers because audience development was an issue, it appeared in the agenda, so we said, okay, let's try. Let's see what does it mean to be an audience developer, which competences are required. Actually, this is an occupational profile that doesn't exist, so we have to invent it. So we asked people, what's your job? Where do you come from? What's your background? How did you mix your background? What's, what are your challenges? How would you define your job? And we came out with an occupational profile and we trained a lot of people across Europe and they were individuals, professionals, part of organizations. The idea was giving them the means to making a case for uh, audience, audiences into their organizations. We learned a lot, it was an amazing trip, we met a lot of other people along, and uh, we mainly learned that it's not about individuals, it's never about individuals, it's always about organizations. Because no one can achieve that goal, being as, as usually is the last one, in charge of delivering some kind of content to some kind of people, possibly many people. Possibly diverse, possibly happy, but anyway, one-man show. And this is not a one-man show. So we realized that the real dimension was, and the real challenge was organizational. And uh, then, uh, while we were working on this side, let's say, coming more from the organizational theory and management, and planning, because planning was our main tool for actually uh, talking about audience development. Uh, in the, in the, at the same time, there was another European cooperation project called Bespectative that is now in its second edition that was tackling the issue of participation from a completely different perspective, and it was the artistic one. It was talking about what does it mean to bring people into the process of creating something, artworks. So it was quite diverse from our perspective, but what happened is that actually they came across a lot of challenges. They realized the amount of impacts on the organizations and artists that this process of involving people into the creative um, part of the job was so strong. And this also introduced, like, you know, that kind of little flea in our heads because this was something more. It, go, it actually went beyond our idea of audience development and helped us shaping it. Then there was the tender for, uh, of the DG culture because Europe was really wondering what audience development was about. It was a priority, actually, yes, it was. And they were trying to uh, support this, but also for them, it was a challenge to define what audience development was. Is it marketing? Is it education? Is it numbers? Is it quality? What is that? How does a good audience development project on my desk look like? So this was the question. And what we learned through that uh, study, also with involving this time again other people, so let's say the partnership was uh, widening itself. No? We were becoming bigger and wider and in including other voices. We discovered, I think, two main things that are quite important. Of course, beyond, I mean, you know, 
a showcase of the ways we were doing, actually organizations were placing audience at the center. We were saying first, audience at the center is the only way. Or you put it into the very heart of cultural organizations or there's no way you can reach long lasting uh, goals. And um, another thing quite important was that uh, change was the key word. So we introduced the idea that really changing was the focus. And we asked to the 30 case studies that were included into the study, what was change about? How did that happen? And suddenly, let's say, policies appeared in our discourses and narratives. Because without a context, without politics and policies, we don't have the conditions under which actually cultural organizations can make what they have to do. So uh, besides that also, I say that the study was itself, let's say for us, it was also a momentum because it was the moment where we could say, okay, we can say, and we can say it loudly, that audience development is outside the domain of marketing. It's inside many other domains. It was about, we had the literature review through which we really tried for the very first time to make sense of the complexity of the issue. And so also I would say policy, politics and complexity entered our narrative at that time. Then we had another project, which is ongoing now, it's about to end, which is Connect, that was trying to actually, um, let's say, tackle the challenge of the formal education system, because we don't have people trained for that. It's not just that cultural professionals are, have been trained years ago in our context, and so they don't have the skills, because challenges at that time were not the same. So the leadership, so leaders of tomorrow, cultural leaders are not equipped, future cultural leaders are not equipped because they are trained just like they have always been in the same way. But while we were tackling this particular challenge, putting together students with professionals and learning a lot on how amazing it is when you put students and you mix generations actually into your discourse, what we actually uh, discovered is that we introduced something. We were always about talking about planning, but we really introducing, introduced some new ideas that now are fully embedded into the Adeste Plus. And those ideas were mainly about prototyping. It was about introducing the action research as a way of doing. So it's a test and trial process and learn by doing as really the key through which we could look into processes. So we didn't ask them, just make a plan, that big, huge plan that will save your organization in the next five to 10 years. We were saying to them, you need a plan, but let's try this out little by little and see how it is. And use that to learn every day. So this was what we actually introduced at that stage. And then we arrived to the Adesta Plus. So what's actually uh, happening now is that our definition, our former definition that was an audience agency-based definition of a planned organization-wide approach to extending the range and nature of relationships with the public based on an understanding of their needs. It helps cultural organization to achieve its mission, balancing social purposes, financial sustainability, and creative ambitions, was, yes, of course, our starting point, and it still is, in a way, because it's looking into the audience development arena through the lenses of organizations, because this is our audience. Hmm? But uh, we know that this is just a starting point. So we would like also to challenge this definition, introducing creative ideas, the creative process, the co-creation, the participation as another perspective. Seen from the policy perspective, it's a completely different thing because for them, it's another issue. It's about creating conditions for society, blah, 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 or whatever. So of course, it's different, but this is where we started from. And uh, uh, let's say this actually brought us with the two main learning that were also, let's say, cross-cutting learning over time about our ideas of audience development. And where, first, that diversity is key. Without diversity, there's no learning. And this was true for us as partnerships, always growing and changing. And this was true for audiences, and this was true for cultural organizations and artists. So keeping in mind that this was the diversity that we also tried to mirror in this room with you in the selection process and also in the design of the, of the sessions of this summer school. It was about diversity as much as possible. 
And the second thing we learned a lot is that planning is not enough. Planning is fine. Planning is key because otherwise we are just talking about doing things very well, but doing things. But it's not enough because planning is not a changing process, almost never. And especially planning can easily happen without talking to any of your audience. So you could do that sitting in your room, maybe with your colleagues, of course, doing it well, but without involving people in, at any stage. So these were the limitations from which where we started. So these are, let's say, our ideas, let's say the values that are in the background for our idea of audience development. First of all is that this is about a cultural challenge because it relates to the very essence of culture. So our reason to be as the asset for human beings. So this is the idea that it's not just about management, it's about completely redesign our role as cultural organizations, not just in Europe, but in the future, in our society. So it's really about thinking what's the meaning of what we do and asking ourselves and questioning constantly why we are doing that, for whom am I doing that, what I want to happen out there. So that's the, the real meaning, which is not really a given Okay, it's not so evident for a cultural organization. So until a few years ago, this was not a question at all in this sector, and as in many others, I have to say. Then, of course, it's strategic. So strategic thinking is necessary anyway, because audience development, our idea of embracing this challenge, requires so much time and organizational commitment. One of the huge problems is that doing projects is amazing, and maybe they can even work. But after the project, end of the budget, end of a dream. So you build up a relationship, and then you close the door. So you spend like two years trying to convince someone to step into your museum, and then you just simply close the door, because the, the budget is over, the project is over. And uh, the idea that organizational commitment is quite strong, so we need a lot of time to get there. And this necessarily requires a strategic approach. And then, even more important for the reason we are here, is that it's a systemic challenge. So we can change anything alone. Not just as, indi as individuals into the first address that we couldn't, because we needed our organizations. As organizations, we can't, because we can maybe reach and be very good with our audiences, our reach, let's say, but we are not changing any way, anything out there. So it's about all organizations together, on the same place, at the same time, willing to achieve that goal. And the other thing is context. It's systemic because of context. So this is something that really has to do with the responsibility of each one of us, as researchers, advisors, academics, uh, artists, producers, programmers, whoever you are, and policymakers. And this is something that should be tackled this way. And that's why ADESTE also includes, not just in this summer school, a policy forum, but also policy partners, because they are there questioning themselves about what's the way we can really produce the change we want to see. And then, of course, it's about complexity, because this is a domain of complexity. We didn't want to reduce that complexity. We didn't want to make it too simple. And this is why also this uh, summer school is so rich and diverse because we really know that it's not about reducing complexity, it's about managing that complexity, also get, getting lost sometime, but knowing always that you are living in the right place. And last but not least, uh, it's content-rooted. So we know that planning without process doesn't work, but we also know that processes without contents are nothing, meaningless. So we know that we are here because we produce culture. We are talking about contents, arts and culture, and that quality should never be given up because this is what we are talking about, not just how we get there, but what we actually do. So these, in a way, are the principles, let's say, that were in the, in the background. In, uh, as, uh, in the Connect project, we created a manifesto as trainers that is also, let's say, part of the idea. And it was, is, this is much more about, not much the values and what we believe, uh, in, in the back and our beliefs in the background, but the, much more linked to practice. So our idea of practice is that we have to learn by doing, involve users, and we could talk a lot about are they users, are they audience, are they simply citizens, 
we can have a conversation on that afterwards if you want. Um, use evidence, because this is not just about having wishful thinking, it's about using evidence. Uh, prototyping as a way of working that is strongly embedded into the Alistair Plus project. Encourage small steps that lead to big change, not huge planning without uh, little steps. Make the most of diversity, as we were saying. Be curious, of course. Keep asking questions and be bold. Learn from mistakes. So all what we, we learned so far uh, was built upon mistakes. Okay? So we like to do mistakes, and we are really encourage you also to show us whenever you see something that really doesn't work for you, because this is always increasing, uh, I mean, our discourse. So it has to be holistic organization-wide, because otherwise it doesn't work. It has to be based on learn by doing, of course, because this is the way of introducing thinking, making so that everything is an action research. Whatever action you do is an action research. User-centered and data-driven. Considering that we started with data-driven, user-centered is like a more recent uh, approach because we realized, together with the rest of the world who is using design thinking for whatever, we realized that actually without that we were losing uh, also in practical terms, not just because we believe that. Because concretely, if you don't think in these terms, you don't use these uh, structures, if you don't involve the people you want to work with or work for, you will probably end up with something that doesn't mirror their needs. And it's about change. Okay? We know that it's, we have to change something, otherwise you wouldn't have invested five entire days of your life, and we know the effort that this was for all of you. Uh, but since it's also about questioning, I would like to stress that change is not good itself. Okay? So the idea is that really, the important thing is what kind of change you want to do. And that's the political statement, that's the political side. So what's the kind of change you want to see? Because we have to be willing for that change. It has to be intentional. Okay, we have to go where we want to go. It's not that change is needed. Change, it's everything. It's given. Change is there. So what kind of change means really bringing us, pushing ourselves to think in terms of impacts? And our impact vision should be uh, quite, um, I would say, much more clear. First of all, to ourselves. So I would maybe skip this. I mean, this is about how good audience development looks like in our understanding. So you can, we will have the slides and so on, but I think it's not needed. It's, everything has been said somehow. Um, besides, let's see, here we are a little bit more concrete. Mm? Okay, we are a little more grounded in the idea that... Read it later. Read, okay. yeah. <laughs> oh. Uh, not that this, interesting, this is, actually. Um, this, is, this is actually a kind of a model of your sort of classic audience development process, you know, quite a slow revolution around a kind of um, classic, you know, kind of do, you know, plan, do, re review kind of a notion, with, the, with this notion of sort of the extra loop in which you go, mm, hang on a second, did we start off doing the right things? But I think um, much of our observation is that this isn't what organisations really do. Uh, you know, Alessandra talked us through that kind of that that course of work that we've all done together in a partnership, and of course, all of us um, working in our own country as well as observed that these are these things are nice, but actually quite hard to achieve in the very very busy, hectic environments of SME size shaped and resourced organisations. So. Um, we like to think that there's an overarching plan, but we, in a way, in Adeste Plus, we're recognising that actually this is too long a process for us to really put audiences in the centre of. We can start to move towards whole organisation strategies, but we need to be lighter on our feet. And in a way, that takes us into the thinking about how we've actually designed the Adeste Plus programme. So should we... Should we um, so it looks more like that, right? So this is... <laughs> Sounds familiar. That is, that, is that your audience strategy? I think that, that, in truth, is the strategy that, of course, most of us uh, experience <laughs> most of the time. No, this, this is not a strategy. Slide, this, right? is <laughs> this, this is planning. This is planning. Even more planning. than a strategy. It's planning. <laughs> planning, yeah. The lovely side, so... So, um, yes, and I suppose the other thing that we were doing was really recognising that... Um, Certainly, we've observed that the world, maybe, of audience development is moving away from 
the kind of marketing mix style four, five, six, seventeen Ps uh, that you can keep on adding words beginning with P to make it meaningful. And we've noticed that there's a sort of in this move away from the Ps towards the Cs, uh, much more of a kind of co idea of doing things, co you know, co creation, co curation, consulting with this idea of sort of relationship building at the heart of what we do rather than promoting the, the, the more transactional stuff of marketing, if you like. There seems to have been this big move um, in the engagement mix, if you like, towards those things. So we were looking for a program that really, um, I suppose, helped people to feel confident about the quality and practice of their work in the seas, if you like. So um, a big idea that emerged was this notion of embedding design thinking into our Desto Plus program. So just very quickly then, we're going to whiz through some of the ideas. Why design thinking? What does design thinking have to do with audience development? And obviously, in order to do that, you have to say, well, what is design thinking? What exactly do we mean by that? So, um, and before you can ask that, sorry, just to be a bit philosophical about this, of course, you have to ask the question, what is design? A process? A discipline, a way of making things real, a way of dealing with complexity, a way of making things fit for purpose, but basically a brilliant way of finding a process by which you can find solutions to real world problems. So it seems when we think about what we've always been doing with audience development, that process of change, of opening up, of getting more people to do more things in different ways, we've always been thinking about trying to solve problems. But did we have a very clear process by which we did it? So we quite like, again and again and again, we've come back and we've looked at this notion of design as being really very relevant to what we're trying to do. And I don't know, may, many of you may be familiar with this double design, di diamond design um, model. Uh, it's actually, I think I'm right in saying that it was actually developed by the UK Design Council. And in fact, their website is a fantastic resource uh, of case studies and ways of thinking about design. But essentially, what they did, they looked the world over at designers of all sorts of different things, products, services, and so on, uh, experiences, creative, craft, and so on. They said, well, actually, all designers pretty much go through the same process. And it's a, it's a two-part process. The first part of the process is about defining the problem. What problem are we trying to solve? And the second part of the process is saying, aha, now let's start thinking about what solutions we might, we might require. But both parts, both diamonds, require really creative thinking. And they also both require you to do both divergent thinking and convergent thinking. And by this we mean, in the divergent thinking moment, it's about having many, many, many ideas, lots of creative ideas, lots of ways of thinking about the problem. And this, of course, is where it's important to have lots of different voices because that helps you to come up with a big proliferation of different ways of thinking about a problem. But then you have to have rigorous ways of saying, well, what among these issues are the really killer issues that we need to try and solve? Let's come to cut, cut right into the problems that we're trying to sort out. What, what is at the nub of the problem? What's interesting here is, as well, as we have observed, is that um, some people love the divergent moment. They like the, let's have loads of ideas, but let's not try and shut it down. And then you'll see other people in the room at the same time are kind of going, <gasps> can we just stop this? I can't control the whole situation. Now, there's far too many ideas going on here. Can we just cut to the chase and decide what we're going to do? So there's a kind of interesting balance of needing different styles of thinking and doing things in this thing. So... Divergent thinking about the problem, what could all the many different manifestations of the problem be? Intelligent ways of filtering down to what's really going on here. And then coming up with lots of solutions. Again, many, many ideas, the creative part of it, but then also thinking, well, what are the best solutions? And of course, increasingly in an agile world, starting to use prototypes is the best way of understanding which of our solutions is most likely to solve the fundamental problems. So this notion of double, design, double diamond design thinking is enormously important in the way that we started thinking about audience development. And it's really changed, I think, very fundamentally the process by which we think we can achieve things. So um, we, we'll be talking more about this over the next few days, but just to, just to sort of whet your appetite around double design thinking, double diamond design thinking. So yes, design thinking isn't quite the same as design. What do we mean by design thinking? And sometimes I think in the literature you'll see that design thinking and the notion of human-centered design are often interchanged. But design thinking is really much more about the concept of uh, user-centeredness. So putting your users right at the center of the problem definition 
and right at the centre of the coming up with ideas about what the solutions are. So traditional design didn't necessarily have to involve users very much at all. It might have been quite high-handed. Uh, the elite decides what the problem is. The elite decide, whichever elite, the elite decide what the solutions are. But design thinking and human-centred design are very much about putting the user right at the centre, giving them as much control, if you like, over the decision-making process as you can. So here's one definition, a straightforward one. Human-centred design, discipline in generating solutions to problems, making something new, driven by the needs, desires and context of the users. Uh, I, I actually really like this way of thinking about it. This is a footpath somewhere in Kent, as you'll see. Uh, one of them is what you'd call expert-led design, and the other one is user-centred design. Any guess which one that might be? Just in case you hadn't worked that out, I thought I'd label it for you. But, you know, this, this, uh, this idea that, um, you know, architects always like making things complicated, but we like making things simple, that kind of an idea. So, so design thinking, then. Um, one of the reasons that I really love the design thinking uh, frame is because, actually, there's also a branch of design now known as social design, where you're actually applying design thinking to think about social change. Here's a definition that thinks about, excuse the acronyms turned around the wrong way there, but here's a definition that starts to think much more about using the design frame to improve uh, the quality of life, to improve, to, to address big social challenges and so on. Again, stressing, focusing on the needs of the user. But this, this but the social design is about a bottom-up approach, not top-down. It is essentially collaborative, not patriarchal. It's generative and iterative, and it's not singular in concept, so very much allowing for diversity as a key concept in there. Here's a definition from David Kelly, who's probably the grandfather, father, great patriarch of design thinking, so David Kelly of IDEO. So again, um, one of the things I suppose IDEO does is they come along with a very particular kind of process, a number of steps along the way that enable you to focus more on the needs of users. So, And he, t he talks about using certain particular kind of skills like empathy and experimentation as being the heart of their particular process. Um, and he talks quite a lot in the endless TED talks that you can go and see from David Kelly about the idea of uh, that, you know, it's very easy to get things wrong if you do rear view mirror planning. Uh, it's very easy to get things want, uh, wrong if you, um, if you just kind of trust on your own creativity, the sort of, uh, you know, I mean, there's, there's a big debate about what Steve Jobs really was. Was he, was, he the, was he the kind of great creative inspirational leader or was he somebody who listened a lot to his customers? Of course, the truth of the matter is it was a bit of both. So this is kind of interesting. There's a sort of a certain dogma around the David Kelly model, which is uh, also we have to question a bit. But I think what they have done is to come up with what is a fantastically useful model. So we use this model in our thinking all the time. This is the IDEO one. Do you recognise that? It's quite a well-known model. I will just talk you through the key phases because they're important to what we'll be doing over the next few days. So you start off with the idea of you know, we might think about understanding the audience, getting some data, getting, doing some research. But the, the emphasis here is on empathy. It's like putting all that information together so you really feel like what it feels like to be in the shoes of the person you're thinking about. So really using a combination of data and feeling very confident about how you mix and match that to try and get through to what people, what people um, are feeling, experiencing, what's the nature of their problem. And I think very importantly here, that observational research, going and encountering the other, getting a bit uncomfortable perhaps, and getting to know people not like you is very important, this idea of empathize. But then, convergent, so what's really going on here? What things should we focus on? And a great deal of creativity to get you from here to here required. Lots of ideas, again, divergent thinking, lots of different ways of thinking about this. How many people can we involve in the English speakers, hate it. British English speakers hate the idea of ideation. How many people can you involve in thinking about the ideas? And then the best way to get a real understanding about what's going on is you don't ask people to imagine, you give them little prototype versions of something so you can see them playing with things, you can observe how they respond to it. And you don't assume that the prototype is the final thing. You must test and you've got to do lots of data gathering, qualitative, quantitative, and lots of creativity around how you combine those data sets down here at the test stage. So all of these things start to sound very much like the characteristics that we might look for in audience development, right? So that's, that was the thinking that we, we had behind us. And as Alessandro said, you know, in a way, we have this sort of... Um, 
we have these high ideals for audience development, uh, um, but are we actually achieving them? So I always like to think of this idea that we, we, there's a sort of evolution of audience focus, and we aspire to being, you know, in this kind of completely up here in this very civilised, upright standing position of organisational reorientation, the whole organisation thinks about audiences, and certainly in the UK there's a lot of rhetoric. If you listen to the leaders of many cultural institutions, they'll tell you that um, their organisations really focus on their users and their community and so on. Um, I think, to be honest though, we have to question how much that actually is the case. Certainly, you know, most people I think we would see do pretty well-targeted product campaigns, you know, this is what we do, it's great, and we know how to find the people that like it. Certainly, that's true for us in the UK anyway. Um, you know, most organisations get a bit of regular audience feedback, whether they look at it or not is another matter. Um, then you do, you know, increasingly partly because we have a situation in which you must have a proper audience development plan if you want any funding. So there is a plan that goes, or oh, everybody in our organisation is going to work towards these goals in this way. But quite often, no one's read that plan for maybe a year or two, three, you know. Um, Increasingly, though, we do find a situation in which organisations who are alert to their audience needs are starting to think about, well, if we want this community on our doorstep to come and engage with us, we might need to do something different. So we are starting to see more products, services, ideas, experiences planned around what, what different audiences actually need. But it, it's still the exception rather than the rule, I'd say. Um, I think increasingly we are seeing uh, a more agile way of thinking about, about audience development, that um, people are more willing to try things out. But again, that's still quite new. That's quite future practice, really, for us. But this idea that we, we kind of very quickly um, adapt strategy along the side of the evidence that we're able to kind of work in a, not in a waterfall way, but in a very quick and adaptive way around the change, very rapidly changing needs of our audiences, I think that's still really a dream for us. And so we really want to say, well, in, in the world in which we're living, this is where we've got to get to. So Odesto Plus is really a program designed to test out how far you can go. What, could, how, what, what, what practices could you adapt that would allow you to do that easily and painlessly to move from one model to the next? Oh, yeah, and it actually involves audiences in making some decisions as well. That's the ultimate. So um, I suppose the thing that we... This is a model we come back to a lot for those of you who like models, but we're thinking a lot about double-loop learning. So we think that the way most of us do audience development all the time at the moment is got some goals, got my action plan, said, you know, I'm going to this many people from this community in this way, know how I'm going to do it, fantastic, let's do it. Uh, here's some results. Uh, interestingly, our core audiences keep coming back, but those new audiences who we really wanted to engage with they haven't come, but never mind. Let's just keep doing the same thing. We'll set out with some new goals. But we never really, we don't always stop and think, well, did we get it right in the first place? Were we hoping that those new audiences were going to come and see the old things that we already do without thinking, well, maybe we need to do some new things for those new audiences and so on. So um, we're, I suppose we're always trying to, to encourage double loop learning, which takes us back to going, well, why? Was it really possible? What were our assumptions that made us think that this was going to work? So we're very interested in the Odesto program in this particular sweet spot, this part here where you have to say, we're going to have to challenge so-called defensive reasoning. We're going to have to say, maybe our starting assumptions weren't quite right. What's the evidence telling us? Have we got some fixed ideas that we need to challenge? Are we working with prejudices which aren't really very helpful? Um, fast thinking, the automatic, well, that's how I think, so that's the way it is, let's just move on. So we're hoping in a way, and, this, and we're all part of this journey, to move towards a kind of self-awareness, which is about an awareness of others as well. So that's really the kind of space that we're, we're really interested in in the Odesto Plus program. And I suppose we were also looking at what successful organisations do. What's the practice? We looked at the Engage Audiences programme. We've looked, uh, I, I look around the UK about which organisations are really making a big difference, bringing new different audiences in, um, in control of their own fate, if you like. And I'm just going to share a couple of ideas with you. So most of us, and I know this for a fact, most of us are feeling completely data overloaded. There's shed loads of data about our audiences out there. It's not organised. We can't look at it. And we find it a bit terrifying. And that is the story I hear from everyone. They're also being told all the time to use the data, use the data interestingly. And just the word data, in fact, there's a, I think there's a fact, if you put data in the name of your seminar, 
Your, everybody will always tell you that the thing they most like training about is data. But if you actually put it in the name of the, of the seminar, or the workshop you're going to do, it, it's the least popular thing that anybody ever actually signs up for. So we have this mixed feelings. We know we ought to be doing it, but we don't like it very much. Whereas I think some organizations that we work with, they don't think about it as being, my God, I feel so guilty. I just need to do something with the data. They're coming at it from a, um, actually, I'm gonna, that piece of information is really interesting. It makes me really curious. I'm inspired by what the data says. So how can we, we move most of our, our thinking from data overload to data inspired? It's certainly working for some people. Um, We've, Alessandra's always said that prototyping is not just for techies. We looked at organizations that were really successful in both creative risk-taking and being more inclusive, like the lovely Battersea Arts Center, and realized that they have actually built a kind of prototyping into the way they make work. So Scratch performances, the Scratch bar, Scratch is a way of try out, try out performances, which are just part of your process and actually part of your offer as an organization. So really successful um, at both uh, kind of creative renewal and getting new audiences through. We've known for a long time from the um, extraordinary Not For The Likes Of You program that was something that happened back in the early noughties that organisations which involve a very broad cross-section of their staff in planning and audience development tend to have much more inclusive audiences. So we know, we have lots of evidence, although we kind of often just conveniently forget it, that many heads, using your full staff or your stakeholders, do create the best ideas, the best commitment, we talked about the importance of the organisational commitment, and definitely, definitely create more democratic results in terms of audience. And um, I'll just leave you to ponder this cartoon. I love this banana peeling <laughs> unicorn. Um, but we also know that in part of that design process, when you have many, many different heads, who th different ways of thinking about things, different people who think about the world in different ways, you end up with much, much more creative results. And if you're trying to plan for a very broad public, you need that diversity of thinking. So again, the more diversity you can bring into the process, the greater the level of innovation is going to be. So all of these ideas are really driving how we're thinking about um, Odeste Plus. Another big one for us, a very important program in the UK is a program called Creative People and Places. And the idea behind Creative People and Places was that you would make quite a large sum of money available to a place. Um, there were three rules. The first one is it had to be in a place where there was very low levels of arts engagement. The second one was it could not go to any one institution. The money had to go to some kind of collective. And the third one was that you could only have the money if you showed how you were going to involve local people in all the decision making about what was going to be done with the money and what the program was going to be like and how artists were to be involved. What was really interesting is that the way all those partnerships set off to do things actually completely follows that IDEO model empathize, define need, ideate, and so on. Now, they didn't know they were doing it. I don't think any of them uh, would have talked in those early days about working in a design and thinking fr frame. But actually, we've worked on many of those projects, and I started to realize that you could retrofit design thinking onto that. The really critical thing is that Creative People in Places is the first ever wholesale funding program in the UK that has completely reversed all the trends about how many people attend, what kinds of people come to do the arts. So the usual elite are not here in these audiences. They really are about local people. Very, very often the people with the lowest levels of engagement, high levels of um, you know, not... Um, uh, low levels of entitlement, if you like. So, you know, really, really successful at doing that. And they're doing it on an ongoing basis. So they've really used the social design model, not necessarily calling it that, but they, they eventually came to this conclusion. So we were trying to work on the basis that, well, what's really working and how do we embed it? So a bit like with that other one, I'll leave you with this slide to have a little look at another time. So why does it work? But basically... It uses insight and data, but it uses it in a really creative way that people can get behind. Um, it's very people-centered. It demands collaboration. There's a real emphasis on our users' needs. It encourages quick iteration, finding out by doing, our learning by doing things. So we suddenly realized that this design frame was a really, really rigorous process that we could apply to our 
long-standing and unsolved audience development problems. And that's the driver, really, for the programme, as it looks like. So I'll just finish by saying, um, so our de design question was, how might we embed a process for innovation which starts with our users, uses evidence to challenge our assumptions, and makes the most of the creativity of all our people? So that was our kind of big how might we question. And I want to just draw your attention to this. Uh, this is a, th these three words, David Kelly of IDEO is very keen on how might we. How might we is a great question to unlock lots of creative ideas. And I want you to think about this because we're going to try and form some questions for the summer school. Not using Mentimeter, I'm just thinking about how might we do it without Mentimeter. So, <laughs> um, but anyway, but think, think about that how might we kind of idea. This is, um, this is what we, we came up with in a moment. Um, so our program looks a bit like this. Seem to have lost our diamonds, but um, but you know we've we've really we've really followed that uh, the kind of the, the the double design thinking how the program actually works. So we, first of all, we started off working with whole teams across organisations, defining the organisational problem and coming up with some ideas, and then moving on to working in the same way with our audiences. But you'll hear lots more about that, and that was also in your webinar. So, as I say now, um, we were going to do, I think we're going, not going to even try Mentimeter just now, but what I would like to do is to finish this session by saying, is it a bit of a break now? And what we'd like you to do is to have a little think about your questions for the summer school. So given the background and the things we've been talking about, what we'd really like you to do is to think about how might we, dot, 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 what is your how might we question for the summer school? What would you like to walk away from the summer school knowing, how, knowing what question do you have that you would like to have be answered by the end of the summer school? So have a little think about that as you go out. And when you come back, we're going to have think, thought about how we're going to capture those questions. Right, so thank you all. Yes, yes. Oh, there's a box. So we're, going, so we're going to come up with a nice analog, handcrafted version of doing this by the time you get back for your, from your break. Right, so thank you all very much for listening to Alessandra and I. Thank you. And, and get used to, to this Gulbenkian thing that they always fix, whatever. So, so this, is, this is typical, we are getting used to it, but you will have one week to, to see it. So back in, for at three here, at, uh, sorry, four here, so we have, great. We were even, okay, see you in a while. Have a rest, think about those questions, write them down. Sabia que quando lava com lexívia, danifica a roupa e com o tempo...
Hi, everybody. We're going to start the second session today. But I will ask you um, just to listen to Anne briefly, because now the Mentimeter is finally <laughs> working. So we can put our questions on the Mentimeters. So I'll give two minutes to Anne to explain to us what to do. And then we proceed with the rest of the session. Uh, sort of, you know, isn't, there's, some, there's something about, there's some link between madness and keep repeating the same problem over and over again, isn't there? Tiago, oh, da da, look, it's here and it is working. So get your devices out. Are you ready? So some people are very good, and in the break, they gave us some questions, and here they are. Fascinating. And look, they've done how might we questions, which is particularly useful. So Look, you're all sitting there. You haven't got your phones out because you don't trust me, but go for it. Just, re just rebuild that trust. Um, so if you would like to contribute some questions, it will be really useful because we're going to return to this later on in the day. So if you do have a device at your fingertips, uh, you should now be able to put in 9982732 to menti.com. Is it working for everybody? And tell us what the burning questions for the summer school are. What are the burning questions we should be focusing on all this week? Um, my, our lovely colleagues here are going to uh, give us some solutions, of course, uh, through three very interesting case studies. Four? Three? Four? Three? Three, three case studies. Three very interesting case Indeed. So um, just let's use this time uh, usefully to frame our questions. I think once we put, um, you can keep on adding, adding questions. So perhaps if the case studies stimulate any more questions, you can keep adding them and we'll be able to see them. I, you can see the count down here. Come on, guys. Keep going. Right. So, um, I'm, I, as I said, I encourage you to keep on posting questions, and we'll, have a, we'll take a look at them later. And I'm now going to hand back again. Sorry to intervene. Initially, are you? Yes, I think you, it would be very nice of you to just introduce me. So, hi again. Uh, I've given, I've been given the honor to introduce our guests for the first panel. Uh, many of you have met them in the morning because they were part of our case study portfolio, and it's a great. Pleasure to be with you, and I want to thank you for all the work and effort that you put in receiving the people in your spaces, and also congratulate you for the work. So first, we have uh, the from the company from Teatro Maya Volta. I'm always switching their names. <laughs> Sara and Alfredo. Then we have Fernando and Aldo from the Carpinterias. And we have Bruno Reis from the theatre, from Luca Theatre. So the Teatro Maia Volta is a partner for a municipal theatre uh, called San Luis. It's a, a rather big theatre in the centre of Lisbon. It's a beautiful theatre with a beautiful programme. But they have developed a very interesting pilot programme about bringing non-audiences to the theatre by promoting this idea of my first time in the theatre and it's a beautiful project. Then we have Alda and Fernando. They are private entrepreneurs. They are gallery owners. They've been working for years in the sector in contemporary art. And lately, as if they didn't have enough work as curators and gallerists, they embraced uh, an almost non-profit project called Carpinteria San Lazaro. It's a private cultural centre in one of those refurbished old industrial sites in the center of Lisbon. Carpinterias is where uh, uh, wood workshops. So I know it's more like the same word in Spanish and Italian. I can't remember the precise word in English, but it's... Carpenter. It's carpenter. Okay, thank you, Fernando. So we went for a carpenter from making stuff for a place to where you make ideas and beautiful art concepts. And that's a wonderful thing. And then we have Bruno Reis. He comes from the Luca Theatre for you, Children and Youth. It's the only theatre that's completely focused on this audience in Portugal. So it's a pioneer project. It's a year old. And it's a beautiful project because they are making theatre and making educational content for children and youth. But it's really grown-up content. They are tackling the difficult te themes. And yesterday, they started the year and they started it with a cycle dedicated to the elections, because we're going to have parliamentary elections on October 6th. 
And they're talking about that with the kids, and that's a wonderful thing. So I'm going to pass the words to my girls. No, it's not me, actually. It's them. So we will be, so we will be asking them to uh, give a short presentation for those of you who are uh, visiting this morning so that all of you can have more or less... Uh, the, the, an idea besides uh, about what really happened there, because I know it was really a struggle to decide which venue really going to visit. Uh, so we thought it was an opportunity for you also, for the others to really get in the chance to know also the other experiences. And um, so they will give first a short presentation and then we will be doing questions. And if you have more questions, so please feel free, that's the moment, that will be the moment to... Uh, to do them. Okay, so thank you so much. I can give you. Okay. Please. Hello. Um, well, Ines said it all already. Um, my name is Bruno. I'm production director of Luca Teatro Luis de Camões. It's a theater for youth and children here in Lisbon. And currently, it's the only theater that's only focused on these audiences in the country. We hope that changes soon. Um, but in order to give you some context, I have a little video that we'll show you. And we usually show this video in all of the guided tours that we do on the theater. So in this way, you can actually understand which building, territory are we talking about. And after the video, we'll talk a little more. Okay. No número 80 da Calçada da Ajuda, em Lisboa, vive o Luca. Tal como toda a gente e todos os lugares, o Luca tem uma história. Já foi casa de obra do rei, já foi celeiro real, já foi sede da Associação Blen Club, já foi cenário de um programa de televisão. O que é o mesmo que dizer que o Luca já teve outras vidas. Tudo começou no século XVIII, quando o rei Dom João V mandou construir o edifício do Real Teatro da Ajuda, uma espécie de bisavô do Luca, o primeiro teatro de ópera italiana construído em território nacional. Funcionou como teatro do rei até 1742 e só passados uns anos, no reinado de Dom José I, seria reaberto. Por pouco tempo, as portas do Real Teatro da Ajuda seriam fechadas novamente no final do século XVIII, no momento da inauguração do Real Teatro de São Carlos. Já em pleno século XIX, o edifício foi comprado por João da Cunha Açúcar, dono de uma drogaria na Rua da Junqueira. Havia a intenção de voltar a usar o espaço como teatro, um teatro de bairro, espécie de teatro de bolso. Em junho de 1880, para assinalar o tricentenário da morte de Luís Vaz de Camões, era então inaugurado um novo teatro em Lisboa, batizado com o nome do poeta. Duas décadas passadas, torna-se seu proprietário Joaquim Maria Nunes e o teatro, mais uma vez e pouco depois, vê as suas portas serem fechadas. Só no século XX, em 1912, se voltaram a abrir, quando passou a ser sede da Associação Blen Club, que ali ficou durante mais de 100 anos. Saiu em 2015, quando a autarquia cedeu ao Blen Club novas instalações e iniciou um processo de requalificação e recuperação do Teatro Luís de Camões. Estava quase, quase a nascer o Luca. Mas afinal, quem é o Luca? O que é o Luca? O Luca é um teatro exclusivamente dedicado à programação artística para os mais novos, criado pela Câmara Municipal de Lisboa e a EGEAC, que se pretende afirmar como espaço de referência na criação, reflexão e apresentação contemporâneas em Portugal para crianças e jovens nas áreas das artes performativas. É certo que para isso, para que aqui surjam novas leituras do mundo, o Luca precisa de um corpo, esse tal corpo que vive no número 80 da Calçada da Ajuda e que foi reabilitado pelos arquitetos Manuel Graça Dias e Ega José Vieira. Dentro do Luca, na plateia e nos camarotes cabem 131 pessoas, que é aproximadamente o número de amigos que as crianças gostam de ter numa festa para desespero dos pais. 
No palco, cabem dois elefantes africanos, de trombas viradas para a plateia e muito encostadinhos um ao outro. A única dificuldade para os elefantes é fazer a travessia para o palco. O Luca tem muitos corredores, todos com tamanho de gente. E há as escadas, para pés pequenos e grandes, não para pegadas de gigante. Vão dar a lugares essenciais para o bom funcionamento do corpo de um teatro. Por exemplo, o bar, que se espera que tenha limonada, porque os espetáculos, às vezes, dão muita sede. O que é então o Luca? O Luca é um lugar de contaminação de coisas boas, de ideias, de práticas, de linguagens, de formas de expressão, de pensamentos. O Luca é aquilo que se deseja preservar vida fora. Um lugar para as crianças, os jovens e as artes. This is basically the venue. So this is basically the venue where we work on. Um, it's actually very recent. It's currently the more recent venue here in Lisbon. It's a public funded theater owned by the city hall. Uh, we actually only uh, are only one year old. So we come across with this issue. As we say, said in the video, what would be the role of Luca in the city? Which should be our main audiences? How can we address them? What are the best tools to actually get to the goals that we have? So we basically think, let's bring people together. Let's ask for some help. Let's place these questions to the university, to some other programmers, to the other theaters that already the, do this work abroad. And we made an international conference with some guests that we invite to come to think with us on this subject. What should we do? How should we do it? And open the discussion to a lot of people. And I have brought another very short video <laughs> that basically shows the results or the conclusions that we accomplished on this meeting. Sejam bem-vindos ao Teatro Luís de Camões, a que amigavelmente todos chamamos Luca. Claro que qualquer início de um novo espaço com uma programação regular dedicada a um público específico no contexto de uma cidade impõe um tempo de reflexão. E o teatro também é um lugar para refletir e é um lugar para pensar, para questionar e para construir. Por isso, ao longo deste dia e meio, vamos ouvir, partilhar e trocar ideias sobre o que é e o que pode ser um espaço cultural e artístico na relação com a cidade, com o território educativo, com os artistas e com as crianças. Yeah, choosing shows because they're interesting and because they're poetic, like like Fabrice said, a theater it's about it's about about poetry. Jean Genet disait Créer, c'est toujours parler de l'enfance. Euh, voilà, je, je suis tellement d'accord avec ça. Muito boa tarde. Nós vimos cá um pouco para partilhar um processo que tivemos a desenvolver durante três sessões com esta turma e, e partilhar isso e partilhar também a visão dos, das próprias crianças sobre a cidade, sobre a cultura, sobre os espaços dedicados à, à criança. Parece-me que são tentativas também de dizer nós queremos ter uma opinião sobre o que é que é a cidade, o que é que é a cultura, o que é que é o teatro. Acho que é mais fácil chegar ao pé de qualquer público se falarmos a partir das emoções, mas com as crianças isso é mais... é, é um atalho mais garantido. Criar e brincar, e brincar aqui no sentido artístico, performativo e educacional da palavra, 
ajuda-nos a estabelecer uma rede alargada de relacionamentos, não são uns com os outros, humanos e não humanos, mas também com o mundo ao nosso redor. A educação ela é imensamente maior do que a escolarização e, inclusive, ela existe em muitas sociedades sem a escolarização. No entanto, a cidade organiza-se, faz barreiras, mas organiza-se para ter as crianças. Aquilo que um teatro, digamos assim, do meu ponto de vista, pode representar, que é a ideia de uma performance poética que vive a articular os sentimentos do mundo. Na verdade, isto é um grande desafio, ainda por cima, um, eles assumiram este desafio ao contrário, não é? Em vez de perderem este, estes primeiros meses a tentar criar uma identidade muito segura, o um nome, não, começaram ao contrário, que foi começar a refletir e a questionar sobre que identidade é que um teatro desta natureza deverá ter, se quiserem aquilo que, que se espera depois desta, deste início de, de, de trabalho, também do Luca, deste processo de reflexão, será a de que possam tornar-se cada vez mais como um lugar um, para olhar de novo um, a infância, porque, na verdade, todas as crianças que aqui vêm serão as mais importantes uh, do mundo. E, portanto, é isto. Obrigada pela vossa atenção. Resta-me, simplesmente, agradecer a todos vós, cúmplices neste desassossego, que bem sabemos nos inspira, que nos agita e, claro, que nos encanta. And to make a long story short, our core in our program is basically contemporary arts, performing arts, theater, dance, music, and we do also conferences and talks. Uh, we have one artistic director that chooses, curates the program that we host. We co-produce performances. We invite artists and companies to actually present their work there on the, on the theater. We also buy performances that pre-exist. Our artistic direction chooses these performances and invites the artists to actually present them on the venue. Uh, and we are currently working to establish several connections. We are meeting with all of the possible partners on the territory, those that actually live side by side with the theater and those who live on the other side of the river or on the other side of the country. The idea is to get together as much audiences as possible, though never forgetting that we are a public funded theater by the municipality, by the city hall. So our main core is to work for the families and for the schools in Lisbon, the capital. And nowadays we have been figuring the best ways to do it. try to maintain the micro in my hand. Um, we have some images. We had this morning the, our presentation in Carpinteria São Lázaro. So it's a bit difficult to talk about this project in 10 minutes, but we brought some images uh, that uh, with our text and our explanation, I think you, you can understand uh, quite well what we aim with this uh, project. Can we have the, the? OK. So our name is Carpintarias de São Lázaro Cultural Center and as Inês already explained, uh, Carpintarias has to do with uh, the original function of the building in the middle of uh, Lisbon. It was an old carpenter's workshop 
uh, that began to function from 1928 on. Uh, it was very important for the several construction phases of Lisbon that grew a lot in the 30s, 50s, 60s and 70s. So all those wooden panels from doors, floors, windows, etc. probably were made in that carpenter's workshop in Lisbon. And when we tried to choose a name, we thought, why change the name? What's good and has proven good should be maintained. The only thing we did, we put an S of the plural, Carpinterias, instead of Carpinteria de São Lázaro, because we still are doing, creating, and uh, innovating but uh, not with wooden objects, but cultural programs and projects. So that's the name and the story of the building uh, was, the yeah, it was a, pump, yeah, the building uh, got deserted in the, in the end of the 20th century because with all Ikeas and Akis and Leroy Merlin, people didn't want to have tailor-made uh, doors anymore. They just bought them in the hardware store. So the carpenters got less and less work and it, the space got deserted. And in the end, uh, uh, there was a big fire that devastated the building. And after some time, the municipality thought that this building shouldn't be a ruin in the middle of the city, but should have a an important function for that part of the city. So they um, put out a public contest, a public competition, with the challenge to the people and organizations and associations to hand in and to present a cultural project for that space. Uh, our association handed a proposal in, in 2014, and we won that contest. So since then, we were attached to that building, and our lives are not the same anymore. <laughs> and um, we started to plan and to begin everything in 2014, and finally we opened... Really, we opened the doors in 2019, having done some programming before, and now I think Fernando wants to say something. Well, uh, I think it's also important to say that in 2017, um, in the middle of the construction work, we had this uh, agreement with uh, with SIAC, uh, the Iberian uh, American uh, capital for culture. Lisbon was the the city that hosted that event in 2017, and we had programmed two exhibitions uh, there. So we had to stop the work, uh, the construction work, and we did this opening in the middle of the construction work. So we used this as an uh, excuse to do two exhibitions, um, or three exhibitions. The exhibitions uh, itself with the, with the artists, Los Carpinteros, was the first one, a Cuban uh, duo, uh, which helped to create all this uh, communication uh, phenomenon with Los Carpinteros and Carpinterias de São Lázaro, which it was very good for us. It created uh, an immediate uh, awareness, and we had a lot of media interested in the project, and it was a way to prove that the, the space would be a culture project. This is a big uh, building in the middle of the old city. A lot of people wanted this uh, building, uh, from companies to commercial projects, and uh, the city hall stood for their plans, and they sticked with this idea of creating a cultural space. So it was really important at that phase to uh, show the city that it would be a cultural space. So in the end, after these two big exhibitions from uh, Los Carpinteros and then Alfred Jar also, we closed the door. It's, it was a huge success, those two um, exhibitions. We closed the space. We, in, 19, in uh, 2018, we finished the construction work and we opened in January this year. So it's still a very recent project. And, um, well, about program and audience. Um, our aim is uh, multidisciplinarity. I'm sorry. When you get to 50, you start to be dyslexic. <laughs> I can assure you that. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, 
essentially what we had to do was to create a cultural center. Normally, independent spaces uh, try to have a program more on visual arts or theater or dance or, or music. We didn't want to do it. We wanted to cross all these areas. So we had to create a cultural center. So when we look at the other cultural centers, they are very different from us, beginning with the funding. Um, we are completely private. Uh, we don't have any public funding. We don't have any private funding, but our own. So we have to create um, a way how to develop the, the project and find always uh, the way to finance it. Of course, we have the help from the city hall because they, they rebuilt the building after, after it was a ruin, uh, but only the walls. We had to create all the space inside. You can see it was made for us. It took some time. We had to try to have some partnerships, and uh, in the end, we had this kind of a partnership, but uh, in the end, we all gather our money, <laughs> and we put it all also in the construction. After opening our doors, things started to be different because we, we knew that after opening our doors, things would be easier because we could show the space and the project would be a real thing. And so we tried in 2017 to have a, a positioning um, not only through culture, uh, arts and uh, crossing those areas, but also with this idea of innovation and creativeness. Also as a space who attracts and who works with ideas that also help to a more sustainable society. So we, we created this, uh, this uh, positioning in 2017, and from then to now, we had all these new companies and big companies that were very attracted by the space, by our project, and they start to develop also some events with us regarding knowledgement and uh, innovation and creativity projects. So, in the end, we are a cultural center with a broad cultural program in different areas as fine arts, music, dance, theater, cinema, and gastronomy, with the aim of crossing these areas and consequently bringing together audiences that normally move apart in their own circuits. This is something that we see everywhere, not only in Lisbon, but in several cities. People tend to go to the areas they feel attracted. Theater people go to theater to see theater. Dance people sometimes cross with theater, but normally they go to dance. Music, the same, which is classical, uh, you read it, uh, um, music or rock or uh, electronic music. So our aim was to build something different, something that uh, we know that we couldn't on, not only do another space um, equal to other spaces in the city. We had to be complementary. So we knew that that was something that was not being done to cross the areas and consequently this audiences too. So we worked that way, uh, mixing and creating simultaneous programs with several of these areas going on in the space from the beginning now in 2019. Also, together with these artistic areas, we have a program related to knowledge, where innovation and creativity are the motto, also related to sustainability, and where we create an open field to connect with private and public companies and organizations that are cutting edge. For example, I can tell you two or three projects we did. One with Mercedes Mobility was an hackathon inside the space. Uh, there are some images that show as a working space and a working creative space. And also the e-waste summit, which was the first electronic waste summit to discuss how electronic garbage will be handled in the future, but also Archie Summit, which is a, a big event with lots of architects and debates and so on, talking about what architecture will be in the next uh, future. So all these new relations and dynamics created allow us to find new opportunities, but also new financial sustainability. That's being a way of have, from the beginning of the project, companies around us that are aim and they like to help us 
finance our project and also our cultural project. Well, this, is, this space is a fundamental piece for everything we do in it and around it. And as you can see in the images we have chosen, you see that the public is uh, broadly attracted to the space. And as Fernando told you, we have achieved something we are very fond of, like crossing the different audiences and being able to see people from cinema in art exhibitions and people from the fine arts in theater and dance uh, manifestations. So this is really something big because we always see them like very separate. And um, also, this is the, the, the reason why we left the space as open space as possible. We have two bigger floors, the auditorium and exhibition floor, that's the biggest one where most exhibitions happened, also in 2017. And then we have a downstairs floor that at the beginning we thought would be likely to host our offices and then we, and we, and we, and we understood that after all, it's a great space to do video shows and performances and dance presentations. So we also have our residency there, the artist residency we started last year uh, with a um, scholarship uh, by Gulbenkian Foundation. And um, we will have it again this year, but we want to talk about that later on. And um, for us, it's uh, very interesting to see how we have this maximum flexibility in the space because we left it as open as possible. And so we can adapt it to all the different contexts and projects that happen there. And it's really amazing, and this is also why we brought you all these images, as how this uh, space always changes dramatically and it always presents itself in a new and surprising way. So this is also something we hoped for and we're really glad we, we achieved that with, because you can work so much with lightning and the sound and uh, curtains and you create new spaces every time you do a new project. Uh, well, since uh, last January, we had a strong program with exhibitions, concerts, dance and performance presentations, workshops, debates, summits, and gastronomic events. For us, also, gastronomy, it's something that is a, a cultural product. Uh, and all, and I think everybody from southern countries know how important food is and uh, sitting around food and have all these moments together, but also in the north of Europe these last years. You can look at what Scandinavia have been done with lots of new ideas, with restaurants, gastronomy events, and so on. So for us, all the mixing with all these areas, it's a very uh, interesting way of connecting people, of crossing people, and in the end, it's a bit like uh, a best uh, communication would say. You have to find what really motivates people now and to create a link and create a space and a way to communicate so people are always looking for something in that space. Probably we don't have to have a program, a very strict program, with all the areas well defined and uh, with, a, with a schedule very organized. If we can create somehow uh, this ability of being attracted, uh, attractive to a, a, a different set of uh, audiences, people are always looking for uh, what you are doing in the space and the project. So it's a, another way and for me it's very nice because it's a flexible way of always creating new things. Of course it's more challenging because we have always to be creating something that is um, attractive and somehow not new and original. Sometimes we're able to do it but we're in a ready-made uh, society. But uh, in the end, it's a challenge, but it's a way of keeping interest uh, along the project and not only this phenomenon of being something new and then you start to be fading from the interest of people. Uh, another thing it's important, and I will give Alda to... Well, the... 
the issue we're talking about here with Adeste uh, is the public, and uh, this is also something very important for us. Uh, the crossing over of publics on the one hand, but also the position of Carpinterias in the city um, is very special. We are deep into a multicultural neighborhood uh, where a lot of people come from different communities and which we also want to address because we already noticed that the people that come from a cultural informed background, they all come to the center and have been visiting us. Now our next big challenge is to contact and connect with those people from those neighborhoods. They, they are, the city hall, they counted like over 110 different uh, cultural ethnicities and cultures in that space between Muraria, Martimnij and the uh, Colina Santana. So, but the most, the biggest communities probably are the Chinese, the Indian, the Pakistani, the Bangladeshi, and uh, Brazilians, then you have a lot of people from Africa, from Eastern Europe, and also from Western Europe, like the Portuguese themselves, of course, and a lot of new communities coming from France, Germany, etc. Um, so for us, what we see now as a big challenge is, challenge is uh, mostly to interact with these communities that come from a uh, more humble background, culturally and educationally speaking. And one of the first approaches we did to interact with these communities was in 2017, when our exhibition program was free. So nobody had to pay entrance fee, and that really triggered uh, the curiosity and the possibility of people just coming in and see what's happening. If they, if they didn't like it, they could go out again and they didn't have to pay for it. So it was also the possibility to open doors and tell the city, we exist, we're here, just come by and visit us. No, no risk. And um, now in, in, in 2019, our approach with these communities was firstly through gastronomy again. We had uh, chefs from the different communities invited to be part of our opening program. We had an African chef, an Indian chef, and a Chinese chef from the communities nearby, and they brought their, their food, and also a part of their community also came by to visit them, of course. And food is always a good approach to, to people that you don't know. You can always talk about food if you don't find anything else to talk about. And now... <laughs> <laughs> so now we have, and, and now in 2019, and after these eight months of uh, the opening from January until now, we thought it was the time to really look at these communities, and we found that uh, our next approach and a good approach would be to use the artist residency uh, that will start in October. The open call already happened. We already... Um, have a winner um, and we the challenge to the artists in the open call was please look at the communities that are in the neighborhood of this community of this contemporary art center and uh, and create a dialogue through art and artistic creation uh, with them bring them to the center and show them that this place is also their place and it was amazing we got a lot of very interesting proposals and um, well and the winners are it's it's a Russian art duo they already had a lot of inter you yeah <laughs> I'm sorry <laughs> but it was very interesting because their approach is very hands-on and very community driven and this is what we wanted so we're very hopeful that this will be a good tool like a first step into the right direction, and it's happening, it will happen this year. So this is something we're looking very much forward to. Yeah. Last but not the least, only two ends. About sustainability, uh, Carpinterias is an ongoing project. We opened our doors in January this year, and the next steps will be our own creation in the sense of intentionally crossing uh, all the disciplines with each other and the development of a, the infrastructure of the center. So we will have a, a shop 
also at the center, and the rooftop with the restaurant and the bar, and also artistic residency studios. All these new structures will strengthen our sustainability. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for hearing us out. <laughs> Thank you. Hello, good afternoon. Um, thank you very much for the invitation of being here. Um, uh, my name is Alfredo Martins. Uh, and I'm uh, Sara Duarte. We are part of an um, independent theater production structure uh, called Teatro Meia Volta e depois à esquerda quando eu disser. Yeah, this is always the, the moment of a good laugh. Uh, it should be something like, yeah, what? We are homeless. We are <laughs> no, we have been uh, hearing from such a beautiful places that uh, here, and we bring uh, here a different kind of project. I was joking with the homeless, because we're at, uh, with uh, here, but uh, we're not alone. We're here with uh, São Luís Teatro Municipal, um, and we develop, uh, well, we, we uh, kind of shaped and uh, run a project called O Public Vai ao Teatro. So something like the audience goes to the theater, which also uh, uh, a joke around um, this title of the children's book uh, in Portugal, Anita or uh, Martina books that she always goes somewhere. She goes to the garden, she goes to the kitchen, she goes somewhere, so <laughs> to the farm, yeah. So uh, the audience goes to the theater coming from there. Um, and this project focuses on uh, cultural access and uh, cultural governance. Um, we developed this project always in partnership with the public cultural institutions. Uh, uh, we are now starting the third edition of the project. The first edition uh, was developed together with the uh, San Juan National Theatre in Porto. And uh, the second and now the third edition in collaboration with San Luis uh, Munic Municipal Theatre, City Theatre. I don't know if I have to say. Um, and uh, for each uh, uh, edition, we uh, establish criteria um, and strategies that allow us to um, uh, approach different groups of the population. Uh, most of the times, uh, one, one of the, um, the main criteria is to approach people um, that don't normally don't go to this kind of uh, spaces of these institutions. Uh, then something that uh, in a more technical language would call uh, uh, positive non-attenders. That would be people who normally don't go, but they would like to go. They have the will to go more often. So the, um, or even people who identify themselves as consumers of other um, cultural manifestations, but not uh, performative arts. So this is the, our main core group. Of course, that for, then for each uh, uh, um, edition, we develop uh, additional criteria, geographical uh, age criteria that uh, uh, help us to, to focus on the group we are working with. It's always a long-term project. It's never a short-term project. We always work uh, during th uh, two years, at least, with the, with the groups um, that we invite to, to take part. And actually, this next edition, uh, it, there will be three. It's a three-year project. So uh, um, it's a, a big effort, even for the, the, um, the participants that um, dedicate uh, two and, or three years of their lives uh, uh, having a, um, meetings uh, with us every uh, every like uh, two times a month uh, yeah uh, so it's a long um, duration project that uh, happens mainly inside the the, the this cultural uh, public cultural institutions so it's an enriched project um, and um, we we try this uh, we kind of uh, divide the project in two main moments. Um, 
the first year mainly that we work around this idea of bringing together and bringing together everybody, the, these groups of audience uh, and uh, also the, the institution, the teams that work there as also as um, uh, facilitators of the project and uh, the artists who work and present their works in these institutions. So uh, during, this, uh, for, during this first year, we work, uh, um, we bring them together, meeting the teams, uh, trying to understand uh, how they work, how the institution works, um, uh, going to rehearsals, meeting the, the artistic teams, discussing with them the work, what they do, they are doing, seeing shows, and uh, always after the shows, uh, coming together and discussing their uh, uh, experience, affective and uh, intellectual experience of, uh, of what they're doing. So um, uh, we always we we insist a lot in this kind of this uh, um, uh, gatherings, uh, moments of um, well, kind of a focus group, but uh, very uh, um, shared in terms of uh, of the the experience of the group and a kind of a effect, uh, effective mediation of these moments. Always uh, bringing together some food on the t having some food on the table and and sharing the the all this experience with them. Uh, in the second moment of the of the uh, of the project, we we go into thinking with them what is. Uh, um, programming uh, uh, these institutions and um, uh, bring also other other guests that have different experiences and in the end um, uh, challenging them to to think uh, a three days program um, that is presented in the in the in the institution so uh, um, this is uh, also um, a way of uh, trying to uh, understand how uh, cultural commons can be uh, co cultural commons governance can be also shared with uh, with these groups. Um, so Alfredo has just almost said um, all we in the very a short version, all we did in the first and in the, th the second year. We have been seeing some pictures from the process from the first year, the Critics Club, the a specific work we made with the young, young people from in the educational context in the, with the school. We worked with these, these children, uh, some specific uh, things related to perform it to, to the theater. And they, they, they made some critics, like uh, grown-ups do, <laughs> um, about the plays they, they saw. And then they presented the awards at the end of the, the year in the gala, the gala of the Critics Club. It's like the, um, how you say that in the Oscars, okay. <laughs> Uh, and we have, it's also been shown here the focus group, you know, the way that we, our methodolo methodology, method, metho yes, that thing, methodology. yes, the me our method <laughs> of working. And we're now seeing some pictures that were taken by Stel Valent from Saint Louis, the theater of the, um, the event, the um, audience days, the, um, the programming. The, it was kind of fest, like a festival, three day, days of programming made entirely by these participants. Um, and the, the theme, the general theme that uh, oriented this, uh, these days was the um, theater as a public space. And um, that idea, it is, it's quite related to the way that we feel and um, conceptualize the cultural and the artistical institutions. So we're almost, almost at the end of our 10 minutes. <laughs> I'm just synthesizing something, uh, some, some of the ideas. Um, Earlier, we have heard about, um, I think it was some uh, about uh, audience development, I think. Mm -hmm. This is an audience engagement. <laughs> it's a program. We have, uh, at the beginning of our work, we talked about development, but uh, as long as, 
As we were working in the project since 2012, we have been approaching a different idea in, uh, in the, our interaction with the, the audience, audience. And now we think that engagement is more close to the, the way that we feel um, that we should relate. We, artists, and we, programmers and artistic institutions. Um, for us, it's important uh, the citizen involvement and the empowerment towards cultural programming institutions. We're interested in exploring new models of participation, access, interaction, and social cohesion. Participation in the governance of cultural uh, goods and uh, trying to understand uh, these things here as an integral part of the urban commons, strengthening the bond between audiences and cultural and other institutions through the creation of bounds and effective memories of spaces, and development of interaction and mediation models between cultural agents, spectators, audiences, creators and programming teams. And we'd like to think we have an holistic approach and a systematic approach to the phenomenon of reception. Uh, last year, we organized, uh, along with Saint Louis, a meeting uh, with a long name, uh, uh, as is our apanagem, uh, <laughs> uh, where we tried to systematize, uh, organize a little bit of these experiences, but later on we can, with the questions from the audience, <laughs> Uh, talk about uh, that a little more. So, um, yeah, just to, to finish, we also, um, I was thinking also something that came up in the, in the first pre presentation is the idea of uh, uh, putting the audience at the center, that we've been also working around this idea of uh, who should be in the center, you know, the artists, the, the institutions, the audience, and uh, we are, we're always trying to work around this idea of a center where everybody fits. Um, well, all these uh, different uh, agents come together and find a way of, uh, of um, uh, well, find ways of becoming together, I think. <laughs> Thank you. So thank you so much. It, it's pretty late, so it will be just short question. <laughs> yeah, I have a feeling that our audience might have some burning questions Yes, too. maybe yes, because I have to say this morning I was in none of, the, of this venue, yeah, and I was like sorry. a dying, no. <laughs> and um, so I got, I, I got like like hundreds of ideas popping up actually, because you are re representing quite diverse uh, approaches to the topic, but all of them are really fitting quite easily into our way of thinking, in a way, and or their way. In a way, they are there's the idea of prototyping of sustainability, the idea of involving users in every niche step, and the idea of meeting somewhere and being rebuilding and rediscussing the place of all these agents in a way. So everything is actually into this. Uh, what I thought but was particularly interesting was um, in, in the case of Luca was that bringing adult content for kids because this is really something, this has res been respectful <laughs> of audiences in a way also and it's also that always when you talk with a specific audience what you actually do is talking, is helping yourself to think about others and when they are so specific this really unleash all the potential of being a different perspective. So I really enjoy. So I really wanted to thank you personally. And um, Anne, we can maybe ask for questions. Uh, if you don't have, yeah, please. I will go. I will go. Jim. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I A few people during the last four or five years, also when we were consulting during our program in Denmark, are raising some of the same questions. And one question appears to be even more complicated than any other question, and now it's coming. So the issue of diversity in the context of ethnic minorities, and I see that across Europe, this is a big challenge. And I would like reflections on why is it such a big challenge? And a second question addressing to this would be, do you recruit into your institutions 
at any point any professionals representing these minority groups? The first question is, why is it, so why is it let, let's say that, yeah, why is it so difficult? I think um, it's, it's more difficult to reach out to those communities because not that they're not interested in culture, but they have a very, most of them have a very traditional lifestyle and they are very... Uh, focused on on their own life and sustainability. They are mostly dedicated to commerce or hospitality uh, uh, businesses, and uh, and they're very much focused on their traditions of their countries of origins, and not very interested in contemporary uh, manifestations of culture. They are interested in culture, but in their own culture cultural manifestations and religious traditions mostly. So contemporaneity is not an issue for them. So that's why it's difficult, because they're not out there looking for that. Yeah. If we're talking about the second generation, it's completely different, of course. But on our case in Carpinterias, we would like to start also with the first generation. Because for the second generation, we have several programs prepared, artistic residencies in music, performing arts, and, and we know that we'll have a much easier task to do with the second generation. But also, bringing the first generation for us, it's also a, a good goal. Can I just, uh, like... Okay, yeah, yeah, of course. Um, because of the, the first generation, for example, with the artistic residency that will start in middle of October, um, that uh, that artistic duo that was selected for the residency, they made a very smart proposal. They uh, proposed a workshops for children, so when you invite children, the parents have to come too. So you get the first generation to... And then there's a workshop for the fathers. Too. Exactly. So you start with the children and you get the family members, and, and that's how you interact and you become in contact with, with the older family members. We, we have quite a lot of research um, about with non-attending families who would not see themselves as being culturally active, but their attitude towards uh, taking their children for those experiences and in a way that you take them to go to the scouts or that actually that you want these opportunities, even if you see yourself as being not, not really interested, is spectacularly different that people, you know, so this, this bridging and it's also a safe space where you don't have to feel that you're ignorant or, you know, whatever. So, so I, was, I, I was also interested uh, in a way through Anne's question, but uh, what experience are you having with a very new venue about breaking down some of these cultural uh, boundaries and so on between, particularly by, by working with families and young people? Um, so we work in two different directions, I would say, with families and schools. And so the scenario in each case, it's quite different. When we work with schools, we have a person in our team that actually invites schools directly. So we know that with, with any particular project, we want to talk with someone that has an uh, African country or that has some poorer background, we can actually invite that school on that specific context to come to the performance. And we have been quite successful because we have a partnership with the City Hall that we will be able to bring a bus to go get the kids to the school, to bring them to the theatre, make them enjoy the venue and the experience and then take them back to school. But this is a very specific point. It's a very specific action. In general, on the weekends when we work for families, for the moment our main goal is to actually seduce all of our neighbours because the, our closest neighborhoods are not very, um, don't have this cultural 
um, behavior of actually attending. They just don't go, because in that area of the city, we don't have a lot of offer. The ones that we have is very well placed, and those audiences are very um, secure. The, um, with youth and families, it's difficult to approach. So for the moment, we don't have yet a very big history. We don't have even made some surveys or some address questions directly. We know that we don't follow through to that kind of population. We only can able to, we are able to do that in schools only for the moment. I was going to I was going to ask for, for my Volta actually you know this idea of togetherness which you talked about so eloquently you know that bringing people together I know I think many of the successful projects around the world that we know you know have the have almost like different doorways for different communities so they overcome those problems by creating a very different offer for different communities that's very against your philosophy in a way that you want to create a a coming together of people. So, so what's your experience been on the, in the same issue around uh, the cultural and ethnic diversity of your audiences? Um, our, um, our groups that accompanied the, 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 the program in the San Luis um, were a little bit homoge homogeneous in the, in the cultural because they, because um, we chose some uh, s the criteria we used. Yes, it was it was <laughs> it wasn't the negative attenders that was residual. Those 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 uh, people. We um, we came together with some difference from ethnic ex experts and countries at the, um, the in the school context. We had a very heterogeneous uh, class, and um, we we were we were we worked on that togetherness uh, in very basic ways, all, all, uh, instantly because of the language, and uh, some of our kids from that class were completely lost in the educational building and system because they don't speak Portuguese, they arrive at the school and um, sometimes big big schools, big uh, educational uh, institutions have uh, at this present moment very, um, they find very difficult to, to get resources to deal with this difference and to um, help these kids and their families to attach to the institution, to the system, etc. Et uh, the artistic language in which we work and with which we work, I think it's a good, obviously, it's a good way of um, speaking the same language and, uh, and sharing and, of course, and connecting. But um, um, it's not enough <laughs> um, because they spend a lot of time in the, in the schools and, uh, and they are really, really lost, I think. We think. So I'm, I'm, I'm a bit gutted about the fact that it's now four minutes past five and we are now due a break. Um, but I must say that, that was the, the three examples you gave, I just think that your work is just amazing. And I, I picked up all these um, fantastic themes and I wish I had come to all three this morning around the civic role, you know, these questions around the civic role and all of you are playing a very particular civic role. I was really interested in how um, uh, mother has been, uh, sorry, necessity has been the mother of invention for all of you in the most brilliant way. So, you know, natural designers. Um, but also, I'm really interested in these questions of um, the, the blurring the old boundaries because they don't suit our audiences anymore. You know, this question about whether you want to go to a theatre because you like theatre. Actually, you might be interested in ideas or having a good time or social things. This feels much more real. This, this, is, this is the way people live now. And I think there's a sort of response through everything that you've been saying. And I think I'm super interested in the idea of how distinctive 
the distinctiveness of the things that you're doing. They do not look like the things that other arts organizations do. And from that, you're able to develop a particular audience, a particular business model. So I think there's something about some really amazing ideas for us all. I'm just hogging uh, this moment because I want to put it all together just to get us thinking. So I want to say thank you very much. Uh, thank you again. Um, I think, so, Alfred, Alfred, Sara, Fernando, Alda, Bruno, right names, yes. So you know their names, because I just repeated them for you. And they're here for the next, to, to today, tomorrow as well? A little bit, a little bit. So they have got some amazing some solutions and some, probably some be even better questions. So find them and talk to them. And actually, that's what we'd like to encourage you to do today now. So we have another break. We haven't finished yet. We have 30 minutes. Yeah. Ah, we're not, we're not going to have another break now. No, it's not a break. It's not a break. It's not a break. I'm lying. I'm so, I'm so, I, I apologize. So. <laughs> so, so. No, I don't know what's going on. Only Alessandra knows about that. So, um, so we, we, and we're due to finish at uh, half past five. Sorry, apologies. So no more, no more breaks. Uh, so what we'd like you to do, but we're going in the garden. Ah. Okay, so now then, you're all starting to think it might be nice to have a little nap before dinner, right? Okay, but now we'd like you to kind of move around a little bit. So we have, yes, it's another task. Are you ready? Are you all listening? Okay, so what we'd like you to do is we would like you in a moment to go out to the garden. By which exit? Should be this one. This exit here, be open. which will be open... Oh, very shortly, is that right? Or you can go around here, okay. So it's very important that you go, this, this is the garden exercise and we'd like you to go to the garden. We would like you, it's really important to find someone you don't know. Now it's not just someone you don't work with, that's someone who you don't know at all. And we would like you to go and introduce yourself to them. Um, and we would like you to exchange ideas about the most interesting thing you've heard today. So choose one thing that really has got your imagination going. We've had very rich pickings here. Uh, one really, really interesting idea, uh, the most interesting thing you've heard today, and just swap that with the other person. Is that okay? And then we'd like you to come back in 15 minutes, so it's tight. In 15 minutes, just come back in, and we're going to quickly review the how might we question. So if you have an amazing idea, after that exchange, you can still go to Mentimeter and put in another how might we question. So find someone you don't know, tell them the most interesting thing you heard today, come back in here and be ready to share. Got it?
we have the mic. Same one you like. I like this one. Yeah, so we'll, so we'll look at it. Mm -hmm. You tell me what I'll, talk, I'll, I'll let everybody, I'll scroll down, let everybody have a look as we go. But if we, as we, as we go down, if you want to pick one out in the out, as a I can comment. Ask them to I can we ask their interaction with this? That we've just, just done now. So I can say, so if you've got any more questions to add as a result of that. Well, we, I could ask him again, did you find the same thing that the other person didn't really agree about how the complete, so, uh, you know, did anybody, as a way of hearing back from Apparently we're not allowed to hand our mics to people, so I think they just have to shout out. It's not time to do mic movement. Just to be sure, but, well, you lead, I trust you. Just, just comment, because I'm going to run out, I'm, I'm, I'm rapidly running out. <laughs> That's that are interesting, that's anything that you think relates to sort of core, core idea, if you see anything there, you can just grab it and yeah. you know, to push the thing home. Right, get that mic, be ready to talk. Are we all back in the room? Are we all sitting comfortably? Simona, Adam. One by one. Uh, one by one. One by one. Okay, so, uh, interesting conversations in the garden. Put your hand up if you did as you were told. Oh, okay, by day four, this is all going to have fallen to pieces, isn't it? But fantastic. Uh, did anybody have the same most interesting thing as the person they spoke to? What was it? Shout, sorry. Mics are somewhere else. Ah, okay. So, so is is uh, Bruno from Luca still here? Yeah. Ah, Luca. So, did you did you do um, did you involve uh, the public in the design of the new building? Of the building itself. Oh, well, of the of the idea of the of the concept. We actually asked all of the audiences, including kids, what do they think that the role of the theatre should be. Yes. Ah, okay. And what, what did children say? Um, they wanted a place to be where they actually can access and spend more time there. They wanted to play. They wanted to be on stage. They wanted to feel the space or the venue as their own. Brilliant. Yeah. That's, uh, that, uh, and, but that's uh, the participation aspect of it very strong. It's mm -hmm. a kind of a, yeah, really interesting. Um, did anybody else come up with, have a consensus with their, the person they spoke to? No, complete divergence. Did anybody have an argument with uh, the person they were talking to? Come on, someone must have done. <laughs> Who's argumentative here? Niels, where are you? The encouraged you conflict. <laughs> <laughs> no, you didn't do it, did you? But that's, uh, that's a complete... Uh, oh, you did. And you agreed. Ah, excellent. Okay. So boring. Uh, always and, agreeing. On, oh. And did you uh, any, any any an argument? No, but rather um, expressive kind of discussion. So we were very sort of. Um, we were two, and then a third one came, and a fourth one came. And, and I felt that there was some energy in the discussion, so it wasn't exactly a fight or something, but people just kept putting another level to the discussion. La layering up. Yeah, layering up. Yeah. Many heads, better than one, better than two, yeah. in fact. Yes. Yeah. And so what, what were you discussing? Well, um, well, as I took the initiative, I continued the discussion from the stage on minority 
strategies and and um, we addressed as I was with an Italian philosopher, this was really beautiful because there's a lot of surplus in the mind of a philosopher. Of an Italian philosopher. Yeah, Italian. <laughs> like, I mean, it's like civilization. Um, so we talked about the words that we use. So I was pretty, um, I wouldn't say like provoked, but emotionally engaged with what happened and the response to my own question on what do we do was uh, we st like linguistically we use terms as lack of something they don't have. They are concerned with their own cultures. They look only inside where they come from. And this is a big challenge. And we were very dedicated to this discussion. And, um, and I think we need to look at ourselves as curators. It's not about them. It's, it, it's I about feel it's does, about me. Does. So yeah. I'm not talking about existential things. It's like professionally, it's about what's in my head. So it was a really lovely discussion, you know? Not a fight, but um, an add-on to a Desti. Yeah. yeah. But that, but that um, uh, the, the, the checking our own privilege. Where is the who, Italian who philosopher? I need Italian somebody philosopher? else. To ah. Can you participate, please? Dario. <laughs> Dario, it's you. Dario, you have to tell Please bring something. So what, what did you say that upset Anne so much, Dario? That's going to. It was like you. <laughs> I mean, I'm not a philosopher. I mean, <laughs> just studied philosophy. It's, it's an old story. Uh, okay. Maybe, yeah, we had some problem about thinking um, yeah, in terms of lack of missing something, of needs, of problem, when we speak about minorities, cultural interests, maybe <laughs> speaking about desires, or yeah, culture and hearts are more an expression of uh, a surplus than uh, something that we need, that we lack. And so, yeah, our point is, uh, how to build a relationship with this kind of audiences, of communities, uh, without thinking uh, in terms of problems and needs to feel. And design thinking sometimes bring us to think in these terms. And, uh, and this can be a problem. Maybe it's just a problem of words, but uh, yeah, it's no, set no, our think, mind in this well, perspective. I, I think there are two issues here, isn't there? There's one about uh, that we, if we make the deficit, the deficit of our audiences, our users, and our communities, that's a big problem, because the deficit might be ours. You know, it might be as, as institutions, we have the deficit, not the other way around, and we have to change, you know, attack those assumptions. But I think that we had, um, with my colleagues at the Mercury, there they are, Mercury over there, and we've had, uh, you know, we've had this conversation a little bit about the problematizing language of design, you know, so it's great, you know, in theory, the process says great design requires you to problematize, you've got to form a problem. So you do, it does take you down that sort of route. They're, they're sort of, they're, they're slightly separate issues, but linked in a really interesting way. Anybody else want to share anything they reflected out in the garden? Did you take creativity and sucker from the garden? No, you don't know what I'm talking about. Right, it's, it's getting late in the day, so good. Right, um, I thought we'd just come back to these questions. Um, I think that we can leave Menti open if you would like to keep adding some questions to it. But um, do feel free to shout out if there's anything you find particularly interesting. I'm going to ask uh, Alessandra if there's anything she likes. I'm going to just scroll gently to so have a bit of a read about what we've got here. So we've got how might we empower ourselves to... Oh, hang on a second. Is it still going? Ooh. Yeah, how, how about we empower ourselves to facilitate innovation involving audience development? I liked, I liked a lot. How might we involve communities who do not attend our contemporary art exhibitions without them looking at the art and saying, but I could do this? Yes. <laughs> of course, this is really something. It was for me. <laughs> it was and my question, because yeah. of course my question is completely the opposite. So how might we involve communities who do not attend our contemporary art exhibitions without them looking at, we, with them looking at the art and them saying, but I, and I, I could do this. So this is a, exactly my question on this, the other way around. So, but I think that there is something very interesting in this topic because there's of course the respect 
for contemporary art, and there's the the typical concern of whoever is dealing with contemporary art about the idea that people actually don't recognize the value of what it is and just say, I could do that. It's just a sign on a paper. I could do that. It's just a cut. Um, and so, but I found it very interesting because I think it's quite controversial because, of course, in my perspective, I'm an art historian as a background, so I can tell you because I know, I know what it is, contemporary art. And, um, but actually, my idea, I, I've got an idea, let's say a rough idea. I'm not a contemporary, you know, but a rough idea of what it is. But still, um, I, I really think that this is a very important thing because on one hand, we, do, we have to respect the work of artists and there's, a, there's an issue with contemporary, of course, because we lack education in that. So actually, we don't know how to look at it and the value of it is not given itself. Uh, is not so evident for everybody. But on the other way, probably what we should do in the end is to bring people understand that. And we had a very interesting conversation with, who was from Porto, Anna from Porto? Uh, yeah, please, would you like to share what you were mentioning about that experience, how they did reverse the question, actually? Please, uh, the mic. I was sharing an example in Portwin's house. Uh, that question is precisely put to the public and, and the public is invited to discuss it. But if you could do this, why, why is it that this cannot be art? Y yes, you can do this. And why that? Is that automatically a thing to say, so this, this isn't art, so why is it art? And then you develop the question, like you were saying then, uh, so who legitimized this work instead of others? So you can discuss it. You can discuss it. It's not a problem that the that public go to an exhibition and say, but I could do this. So let's turn this to a question. Yeah, it's a very present conversation for us about whose quality is it, whose quality is yeah, it. You can't, you, we, we can't get far unless we start to have a different view of that. Uh, stop me if you find anything really interesting that you'd like, how we influence the upper management to think about audiences first, selling in. How I, I, mean, I, I like this one. How might we establish experimentation, uh, piloting as a regular approach within organisations um, without a sense of general panic if it doesn't go right? Artists do it all the time. Why not for audience development? I mean, uh, this, is, this is at the heart of this idea of failing better. Uh, you know, this is the switch from waterfall planning. You plan till you're dead and then you kind of everything has to be perfect before you go live with anything. This idea that we iterate much more quickly, but we're more open to feedback and criticism. You know, you can't live without that. Interestingly, I'm not sure artists do do it. I think, in a way, you know, this this kind of very bold, brave experimentation where artists are willing to take half-formed work and put it into a public arena has taken a great deal of bravery there. But it's certainly core to the notion of design thinking in our work. Uh, let me keep going. You can see we have no sense of general panic if nothing goes right. I mean, we just dance and <laughs> ask you to what stand you up and we just I mean, are wrong with the shadow, but this doesn't matter, I think. I wrong. mean, it's some, failure culture is something that we can really train. Uh, we, we can really be trained to that, so why not? So mainly, mainly, that's the plus, it's a project with a lot of objectives. It's not, I, I don't know if we will be reaching them, actually. <laughs> But, nevertheless, let's say, as Antonio always say, oh, plenty of learning for next time. So, um, <laughs> I'm, I'm quite, I, I like, there's quite a lot of stuff about how do we uh, persuade more conservative leaderships to uh, make the big change towards audience centricity. But there's, uh, but there's something, there was something here, isn't there, about, oops, come back. Yes, um, there was something about... Um, I can't remember what I was going to say, but anyway, there's quite a lot of questions coming about that, but here's an important one. You wish you hadn't asked that, hadn't you? Love that. Whoever thought they'd say that, you don't realise we're going to make you work in the Gulbenkian Gardens, that's the problem there, so... <clears throat> um, optimism, oh, in praise of optimism, yes, sorry, again, the language of problematisation, yes. Bankian Gardens, which is the one uh, that you asked our, us to. Uh, so, do you want to share it? <laughs> so, die, come on. No, basically, um, we came up with three ideas, and then he 
absolutely want us to <laughs> bring it to the Gulbenkian Gardens. Uh, so basically, we thought that it could be nice uh, to, um, um, since we were talking about gastronomy, so food together with theater, uh, it was because we are Italians, so of course we <laughs> thought about food. Uh, so the idea is to um, basically let a premium audience go on stage with some facilitators that can be writers or dramaturgs or um, directors. Uh, and they can talk during a dinner or a lunch about some, I don't know, artistic ideas that then can be poet poems, basically. And then um, the fruits of this performance can be uh, showed to the actual audience which is attending this performance. That can be an idea. And then uh, I was thinking, actually, when I first went to Belém, there, there's this big museum next to the church, uh, which, is, which has like a really big hole outside full of bricks made of... Um, polis no, it's not polystyrol, it's sugaro, uh, I don't know, sugaro. Uh, so basically, the idea was to create a site-specific performance with these uh, bricks. Uh, so where dancers or, I don't know, um, circus dancers can basically um, do a site-specific performance there with the audience. And so, of course, we brought everything to the gardens and we thought about a poetry installation with site-specific artists which can maybe inhabit a little bit this space. So Thanks. <laughs> No, if not longer, brilliant. So, so I thought it was an idea for our summer school to go out there, actually. Yes. So I was. Th this is why I was so intrigued. But yeah. Well, I can't see why we can't have that as part of the summer school. Uh, right. Okay. So moving on. Yes. Yeah, so lots of stuff about influencing. Evidence, I think this is, um, sometimes I think that this is true, we, we need evidence of impact. I think sometimes all the, all the great new ideas, we're, we're poor at making the case. I mean, actually, quite a lot of the, the, the work that we're doing under Adeste Plus comes from other programmes which uh, were great in their moment and then kind of got forgotten about kind of thing. There is something about both evidence and impact, but there's also something about embedding processes properly, not just flying onto the new thing. That's the difference between having a good idea and innovation, really, isn't it? You know, so. And we have a master class on impact evaluation yeah. tomorrow. So. Yes, indeed. Uh, how might we form collaborations and share knowledge across the cultural organisations, industries and genres about, about process and practice? Uh, how might we be relevant to more than the small percentage of the population that regularly or irregularly experience the performing arts? So lots of, uh, I heard lots of interesting conversations going on there about um, carpentierash, if I said it right, carpentierash, um, about that, you know, that brilliant uh, problem that you framed for us around contemporary performance spaces and whose contemporary that is and, you know, kind of how you, how you create a space which is, both distinctive and inclusive, really, cha really interesting challenge that many of us face. Ali, anything you like here? No, you go too fast. I'm oh, sorry. Too slow. <laughs> Again, it seems like there's a lot of management questions. A lot of management, a lot, a lot, a lot of how do we, how do we influence up questions? Yeah, yeah. Uh, this this one here about um, that actually when we talk about quality of the art and so on, you know, do we also talk about quality of the process by which we do community engagement? You know, especially in a world where you can hear it's going to become flavour of the month and everyone's doing it. And I was really struck by um, the kind of interesting specificity and care of process that our speakers were talking about earlier on. What's the micro budget? Yeah. Micro AD. Ah. How to approach AD with an extremely low budget? Lovely. Well, that's an interesting one. Yeah. yeah. Are scared to um, work with uh, people or communities because they think, and in, in that way. 
they can um, lose their creativity and stuff. And I think all of us should like drive uh, to this kind of uh, works and approach. It's sort of a, it's an either or, it kind of has an either or idea in their minds instead of being both and uh, the thing as well. But also, I was last last year. I interviewed lots of uh, leaders of cultural organisations who I thought were really inclusive. You know, they were running really inclusive organisations. And I asked them about the habits uh, and the way they thought about things. And one of the things they all said was how brave they had had to be to fly in the face of the views of their peers, of their artistic peers, that you had to sort of be willing to say, well, actually, this, commu uh, this community work that we're doing has real meaning and purpose. And whether or not you consider this to be you know, the right contemporary kind of art making isn't really the point, but they found that that was one of the most exposing and scary things about what they did. So I think, you know, we, we know that it takes boldness in artistic leadership. And it. anyway, tomorrow morning, there will be the, the keynote speech from Luis Bonet, and, by, and I think that he will also tackle this issue because he's getting a lot... Uh, in, in touch more and more with uh, through especially through this spectative the two edition of this spectative through these kind of questions because this is precisely the core of the and those who are not artists actually are used to be at me for the first example in the first place yeah, I, I started working not 20 but 19 years ago technically <laughs> so I mean that bar but um, actually not coming from the artistic sector not being an artist but just an art historian, so with that kind, and then mainly a mediator, my idea was completely different. And I used to consider that this idea of losing quality was just an excuse, always an excuse. But actually, after 19 years, I have to say that sometimes it is not. Sometimes it's really so that the respect, how to really respect artists in their understanding of what does it mean. So we, don't, we can't ask everybody to be a community dramaturg because it's, a, it's dramaturg. So we cannot ask, so being also developing this kind of idea. And I, had, I have to say that really, especially artists in the performing, in performing arts sector really taught me a lot in this sense because I was used to you know, cutting it off saying, okay, that's, that's the usual excuse. You don't want to think about audiences because you just think about yourself and your peers, which is, it's absolutely true, and I still believe it strongly when it comes to a curator writing a label, a caption that it's really just for peers, and that is your fault, and I no excuse there. But when it comes to artists, actually, this is not that uh, easy. It's so, quite controversial, so it's of, and I think quite our, interesting to be explored. That's why I think that tomorrow morning... Uh, the speech of Luis will be very uh, interesting for you because I think the most um, challenging project yeah. in this sense was Bispectati and there are plenty of learnings there. So we, we, have a, we always have this big debate about whether audience development is the business of artists or of, of, of more of curator program, you know, curators, you know, as mediators and so on. Anyway, many burning questions. So we hope that... I'm, I'm going to try and leave this open for as long as I can. So if you've got questions, add to them. And we will be returning to the questions... Um, in the meantime, I think it is now to wrap, time to wrap up, especially since we dangled the possibility of finishing at 5.30, got that wrong, and actually now we're finishing at 6, but we are finishing at 6. Um, I think we have a task for you tomorrow. Uh, Antonia, would you like to take the mic and tell us our task, please? Because I'm not sure we can uh -huh, switch to the end. So <laughs> this is a task devised for you by Antonia. But they have to take a picture of the task. And we have to take a picture yeah. of the task. We'll find the task while you're doing it. Yeah, could we add the, the presentation here? Just to, to see if it's... No, it's not here anymore. Is there anyone in... Uh, could you please put the presentation we get? If, uh, Meanwhile, Anton, tell us about it and we'll find it. <clears throat> so this is how... I've I go bold and brave. <laughs> so the task for you is to introduce yourself to three people you don't know. If you introduce by tomorrow, if you introduce yourself to five people you don't know, you gain a star, virtual one. <laughs> virtual one. <laughs> we haven't got any stars here. Um, so one thing you should not forget is to set the conversation by telling this person something you celebrated before coming to the summer school. It could be something professional or personal. It's up to you. 
Okay? Is it that clear? So before what time tomorrow? Yeah, before tomorrow. What time? Uh, yeah, before the get together. Yeah, before. So the... you could have a little. You could do it at yeah. the uh, get here early. You could do it at breakfast if you fail to. Yeah, or do it over tonight, coffee. or uh, tonight. Yeah, or uh, yeah. Okay. It's uh, a no, blurry until, uh, task, as you see. Uh, no, also <laughs> no, at the end of the, uh, before they get together. So they have all day to you. You have all day tomorrow. Ah, yeah, before excellent. the get together. Plenty of breaks, yeah. lunches, dinners, and whatever. So and, you and no excuse. And there are prizes for the top, the top number of, of, of uh, connections, right? So yeah, a hug from Niels and Jonathan. Yeah. Oh, right. brilliant. Okay. Woo. Okay, brilliant. Well, listen. Um, let's. Shall we just finish by saying, Alessandra, thank you so much again to everybody here at the Gulbenkian, and thank uh, you all to be for being yeah, very, yes, very good sports. I do. Okay, so this is just a moment to give you some practical information. Please take a picture of these so you won't forget. So no excuses, is it? Take a picture. Uh, the other thing is, uh, don't forget, because this is a summer school, to get a certificate in the end, you need to go every day to the information desk and just sign your name. We have a list of, the whole, of all the participants. Also, you need to check if you made all your options and if the, you have the right stickers. Everyone should have colored stickers on their ID, uh, and they are connected to the places where your options are going to happen. So there's a color code. If you are in doubt, please just go to the information desk tomorrow morning. The first session will be in here, so no doubts, but then the, the other sessions will be in different rooms. Anyone in doubt, just come to us and we'll, we'll help you. If you're not with your stickers, don't panic, it's okay. You just go there tomorrow, you say good morning, and someone will help you anyway. Um, don't change your minds. That's the only thing you cannot do. <laughs> because we just made, you know, uh, made it in a way that all the sessions are kind of balanced in number. So please don't change your, way, or your mind. And if you change, bring a friend, we will swap with you. <laughs> Okay, so that could be an extra task. Find a friend who want to change his mind also and will swap with you. Okay, another information is that, probably you didn't notice, but on that corner where Anne is now, there was this guy, Mark. Mark is recording visually the main sessions. And every day, at the end of the day, uh, we will put them in the lounge area. The lounge area is just, you know, just not, uh, if you're thinking about the information desk, you just have to go along the corridor and in the end you have a lounge area where you can charge your mobile, fo mobile phones. There are two computers for people to use if you're just in need of doing something, some research. Just check the Adeste Plus website, for instance, what's the news. So you can use that space, and that's the place where all the recording, visual recording for the sessions will be. Mark will be doing... Um, digitally, so we have a screen and he will record the general ideas. But then we'll have for some specific sessions other visual recorders and they will just put it on paper. So hopefully in the end of the week we can visualize our journey, which is quite nice. Then we're going to put it also in the website so all of you can just remind of what, uh, remember what, what happened by using this visual thing. Um, I think that's all. It has been really nice, and I must say this, I'm so glad the Mentimeter didn't work. <laughs> because it showed, it showed a very important thing, which is how to deal with real life happening in the real moment, just now. And that's not planning. That's being sure of why you are here, what you are doing, and so you find a solution in the moment. And that happened before our eyes. So it's not theory, it's an attitude. And that's what we want to have, that keeps happening during the week, not the Mentimeter. Yeah, no, yeah, we did it. We just said, take it off, take it off. Okay, thank you very much. See you tomorrow.
need to stay.